On this episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we do something a little bit different. We try Japanese whiskey. Hotozaki. <laughs> Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I don't know why I said howdy. That sounded weird. Oh, well. <laughs> Doesn't sound weird to me. <laughs> howdy. Uh, welcome. <laughs> I just pinned the mic. Uh, <laughs> welcome howdy. to Kilts and Culture. I promise we have not started drinking yet. Um, I'm Rocky. This is Eric. Yo. He's back from the dead with a yep. shaved head. Yep. Um, to quote my House of Pain lyrics from 1990-something. Um <laughs> Back from uh, home, homework for at least for the day. Eric's yeah. been working Technically at home. Technically, still, according to the rules, I'm supposed to still work from home because I'm a computer person. Yeah, most of the time. But yeah, yeah, ish. Mm -hmm. um, so, but Eric is back in the studio today. We have Mac manning the board over there and asking the, or answering the question, not answering, um, asking us the questions that your questions that you're asking to do things. Yeah. He might he might answer a couple of questions. That's true. It's a good That's thing. True. I I want to publicly say thank you to Mac by the way for helming things while I wasn't here and and keep trying to keep also, your seat warm. You guys did an awesome job. What? I said I just try to keep your seat warm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice and warm. <laughs> That's creepy now. <laughs> All right, boys and girls. Today, special treat. Hadazaki. We wanted to try a Japanese Scotch, or not Scotch, but a Japanese whiskey, just to see how they do it. They got a lot of uh, a lot of whiskeys coming out of Japan. Yes, um, I had I I didn't know much about it. Do you mind if I get out some of my notes? Sure. Because I, I I memorized some of the facts, but I can't remember the names. You very get out clearly, your notes, but, and I'll start. Uh, um, here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the the official hand wipey mask thingy as I'm pouring everything for us. Cool, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, Japanese have actually been making whiskey since. Uh, the early 20th century. Uh, it all started back in 1918 when um, basically Japan was trying to uh, adopt and uh, integrate and adapt and recreate all these aspects of Western culture in general because they were trying to make a great leap forward for themselves. Um, and one of the things they did was they sent a guy to Scotland to study how whiskey was made. And this is where I got lost because I forget the names. Um, Masataka uh, Takasuru um, and Takasuru was basically, he was a son of a family who had been in the sake industry for generations, and he was also a chemist. So he went to Scotland and was sent to study scotch, and surprise, surprise, while he was there, he wound up falling in love with scotch and became a total scotch nerd. So he comes back to Japan and starts trying to make whiskey in Japan, and he teams up with a guy, and I forget his name too, um, Shinjiro Tori. Uh, and Shinjiro and him started a company which was called uh, Yamazaki Distillery. That was the beginning of Japanese whiskey way back then. They then split up, um, artistic differences, I guess. And so um, Takasuru went north to Hokkaido uh, and set up another distillery there because the conditions there were very similar to Scotland. So he was able to get clean water, easy access to crops, you know, basically for, for malt and, and wheat and rye and all stuff. Do they use rice a lot more? Mm -hmm. Is that now they no. still use uh, wheat and barley? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and, but uh, Tori, basically, he stayed down in the south, and he established his own company called Suntori, which is actually a joke on his last name uh, as Tori-san. He changed it to Suntori. Um, okay. And so, basically, uh, the company that uh, Takasuru started was called uh, Nika and that was in 1934 so you have Nika and Sontori and those are the two major distilleries to this day in Japan and they have been rivals ever since what we're trying is not from either one of those though okay this I, is, this I, is bought a giant... the, I bought it at the at the Total Wine and uh, I just grabbed one because mm -hmm. it was Japanese characters on there Yep. <laughs> it's called it's called kanji. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, fair. Thank you. This what we're about to try. Um, do you want to distribute now or um, should I keep gabbing? Gab, gab, gab. The, I distribute. I want to get the drinking. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. It's been a long time since I rock and rolled, so I'm totally down for this. <laughs> so should I come over and I'll come over and get mine? Yep. And Mac, you can come over and get yours too. Mm. <clears throat> 
Same to you, Mr. Roboto. All right. And I have to rearrange myself. Um, done with the mask thing. Um, I know that uh, the one, the only thing I know about it is that the the Japanese whiskeys generally do not use the uh, uh, the peat and the smoke kind of flavors. Correct. Um, they tend to be, well, basically um, Takasuru tried that because he wanted to create an ex a very much like a, a, a really authentic experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the Japanese but didn't the Japanese like it. didn't like it. It was yeah. too heavy to pair with the cuisine in Japan. So they couldn't. He okay. could make the stuff, but he couldn't sell it. Um, <laughs> so what? There, there is a problem right there. Yeah. So so basically, um, what's happened is that they've come up with uh, whiskey which are very similar to scotches from other parts of Scotland, but there's nothing that they make that is exactly like an Isla. Like you're not going to get a Laphroaig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or a Lagavulin, Lagavulin or out of this. So it's very very light. They are very light. Um, and that's partly by design. They're also uh, known for being very floral. I was going to say floral, yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually was. I would say. <laughs> okay. Um, sure, I was going to say floral, yes. But the... Uh, yes, floral. Um, so, but basically this one, Hatsuzaki is actually from a company called uh, Kaikyo. Um, and Kaikyo Distillery is the company of the uh, Yonazawa family. And the Yonazawas are, again, they're a sake-making family. Okay. Um, around the beginning of the 20th century, they started making sochu, which is a, dis a native to Japan distilled beverage. Very strong stuff. <laughs> it's kind of like vodka. Um, and then very recently, only like 2017, yeah, 2017, they went into, the, into like a co-ownership arrangement with Mossburn, which some, some of you guys might know. Mossburn is a Scottish company. And uh, Mossburn brought in pot stills, you know, the big copper you know, mm -hmm, proper mm -hmm. stills um, to make whiskey with these guys. What we're drinking is a placeholder. This is a blended whiskey because right now they are waiting for their true the single malt to yeah, mature. Yeah. Okay. Um, so around 2022 20, 20, or so, yeah, it yeah. should be ready. Um, Japanese whiskeys, especially if they use the, uh, uh, there's a certain oak that they use for some of their barrels, which is... Uh, Mizunara, Mizunara oak, um, which gives it a very different flavor than um, other casks that you could mature in, but you don't really get the effect of it unless you let it go for a full 20 years. If you do it less than that, it apparently is horrible. So they will use a combination of uh, bourbon barrels, sherry barrels, um, and other things to get their blends. Right. But for the re for, but for the true Japanese native flavor. You use the uh, the Mizunara. Okay. Enough chip jabba Enough jibba jabba I'm, enough a, jibba -jabba. I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. I'm I can't help it. Channeling my inner Mr. T. Enough jibba jabba I food, Don't drink whiskey. All right. So floral. Anything else? Nose notes. Sweet. Very sweet. You get a very sweet smell to and it. And I have to say, it does remind me a little bit of sake. This nose reminds me of some uh, sweeter sake I've had. I was going to say, yeah, it's almost like wine-esque. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. On the nose. All right. Mr. Mac, do you have any uh, nose notes, or are you just uh, tip-tap typing to the to the peeps? I'm um, talking to the peeps, and uh, and uh, we're making sure uh, all, our, all our levels are correct here. But, um, ah. yeah, no, I'm uh, agreeing with a lot of what you're saying already. Uh, I really don't have anything else okay. to add as far as that goes. All right. Sippy sip. Come by. Tastes very different than it smelled. I'd say the nose is better. Much. Uh, but here's I have to tell you, I'm not surprised. Because like I said, this is when it, this is kinda like their hey, we're here, we're gonna start making whiskey, kind of it's a blend. And here's the thing, when they do blends in Japan, they will import whiskeys from all parts of the world. Most of what's in here probably actually originated in Scotland. Yeah. But they don't have the same regulations that Scotland has on what they have to say. About where they get things from, so I get the very it's very short, very burny, mm -hmm. um, and the bitter taste, like the the side back of my tongue, is like twinging. It's yeah, I'm getting the tingle on the tip of my tongue because it's very. It, I'm getting the I'm getting bitterness definitely on the back sides. Oh, 
Okay, I'm gonna cut it with some water. See if that helps. Yeah, I already did. But, okay, I did which not. I think I think that brought out. See if you agree. I think that brought out the the nose better, but I don't think it did anything for the flavor. Okay. And I was hoping to like this too. But I'm, well, in fairness, I'm hoping to like all of them. But here's the here's the thing. We really need to try a good Japanese whiskey. Yeah. Because apparently they are they really do do it right if it's one of the major players who's doing it. There's, there was like at the st in my defense at the store there was like four or five to choose from mm. <clears throat> and the the guy at the store suggested this one um and i think it was if i'm remembering correctly and i may not be so don't quote me i think it was like 45 bucks ish for the bottle so i figured it couldn't be too bad yeah, there's there's whiskey, there's Japanese whiskeys that go that can range for hundreds of dollars a bottle. Same thing with Scotch whiskeys, of course. But like they're you know fifty, sixty dollars, like fifty dollars roughly. If I had to pick a price point, is where Scottish Scotch mm -hmm. um, starts getting pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, like you can have an Ardbeg or like the Lafroy Ten um, at the, around the fifty dollar, forty five dollar mark. So I figured I was kind of safe, but apparently not. At least with this one. Well, I will say it is starting to relax a little bit. The longer I'm letting it sit, it is getting a little more palatable. And I could see pairing this with Japanese food, frankly, or anything light. Um, Color is non-existent. Yeah. This is like a step above water. Yeah. But that's I mean, I think a lot of time they don't really care so much about color as a differentiator with this yeah, stuff. But also, is the impression I get. But, but if it's a blend of scotch, you know, you would expect there to be more color in it. Mm -hmm. Like from pulling out from the barrels, mm -hmm. unless they're using... Very very low age. I think it, for I think their they're scotches. probably for this project they were probably getting getting in lower age stuff, and then maturing it minimally at home in Japan, so to speak, and then okay. and getting it on the market because they're trying to get a foothold. And the reason they are is because um, Japanese whiskey has become so popular, and it has actually the reason we you probably didn't see more than four specimens at the store is because it's been more than that. Okay, but they've 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 had a uh, there's been a bit of a a dearth of right. whiskeys available. They went through a, there, there was such a massive buying up of it. And the um, amount of time that has to elapse to get the full yeah. you know, 12 so, years, 16 think, years, And that's why years. these guys are trying to jump in the game now. Yeah. Because they want to catch catch it when it... Some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're not, you're, you're not getting a hold of the, the good stuff for the past couple of years is the impression I'm getting. Um, that all started with... Um, the popularity in the West, which has caused the problem, the, the shortage, um, started with Jim Murray back in 2015, declared one of uh, Suntory's pieces, which is the, the Yamazaki Sherry Cask single malt, to be the best whiskey of 2015. Remember, we had yeah, heard yeah, about yeah. a statistic like that, but that's the exact, that's what happened. This okay. guy, Jim Murray, um, and before him, Bill Murray, in the movie Lost in Translation, which is like 2003, yeah, 2003, um, the plot of that movie is he's a, he's a has been actor who's going to Japan to shoot a whiskey commercial, and it turns out he's doing a Suntory commercial. So that made people in the West aware of the Japanese brand. whiskey because yeah, yeah. he says Suntory <clears throat> time or something. I've never seen the movie, but that's what started the problem, which is causing us to be stuck drinking this now. So that was your Bill Murray impression. I can't do a Bill Murray impression. <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't. I've never tried a Bill Murray. <clears throat> I, I could know. sort of do a Dan Aykroyd, but it's always like Dan Aykroyd is. Elwood Blues, you know. Yeah, fair. Fair point. Great movie. I love Blues Brothers. Mm. It's my daughter's favorite movie. Favorite, favorite I, comedy. I will I will argue this. Best movie soundtrack all time, Blues Brothers. If you're going it's with a if you're going with a pop so with good stuff with there. using pop music as opposed to an original score, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think you can beat John Williams, but that's a different category. You know? It's I Blues Brothers, you can beat it because I don't typical, know typical dumb white dude. Blues Brothers is what introduced me to the blues and to R and B. So yeah. that movie really did a lot for me. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. The, um, well, I didn't, I didn't see Blues Brothers probably until I was older. It didn't really appeal to me. Oh. Um, but I know I remember my dad loved it when it came mm -hmm. out. Um, but I was when did it come out? Like eighty. Yeah. Really early. Yeah. On there. Yeah. So I would have been like three. Mm -hmm. So I was like in fairness, twelve. Parents probably shouldn't have been showing me Blues Brothers at age three. Now I showed it to Liam at age six, but that's fine. <laughs> um, 
with all the, with all the cussing. Well, he just loves the car chases and the craziness. How can of you it. not? Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> what do we think of this? So, Suntor, or what is this one? Hatozaki. Uh, Hatozaki. Hatozaki. The name for this one comes from the uh, lighthouse, which is featured on the bottle. It is a, in a uh, 17th century stone lighthouse, which is still there. It's it is near. The, it's near where the distillery is, so they named this particular product after that. It is the finest Japanese whiskey. I don't know if I believe that. I would not believe that. But in the that slightest. is. That's what they say. Oh. I do not believe that. Okay. Mac, Hadazaki, your thoughts, 1 to 10, give us a score, and I'm going to try some more. <laughs> For me, I think it uh, definitely tastes a lot sweeter than what we've, some of the stuff we've had before. Very sweet. So my sweet tooth, or teeth, or all of them. What's left? Um, of it? Yeah. Smell or taste? <laughs> taste. I think at, at, like after it, after it sits, it I, I get like more of a candy type taste to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um so like the, you got the initial like kick and then it just kinda like mellows off really fast. Um which I'm not sure if I like or not. So it is like it. it it's <clears throat> not complex. No, it, it's it's Definitely straightforward. Um yeah. I'm actually kinda giving it like a six, no, no, seven. So I'll go really? 7.3. Really? Really? You yeah. like it that much? I, I actually kind of like it, yeah. Hmm. I saw you a bottle cheap. <laughs> Slightly used. <laughs> Mr. Eric. Um, I like it well enough, but I don't like it like, uh, like drinking scotch. It just makes me want to try the really good, the, the, I want to get the Suntory or yeah. the Nika. Yeah. The, the good stuff, it just makes, it whets my appetite for wondering what that's like because everybody says it's awesome. I'd say, I'd give it a five because I would, um, I could see drinking this just casually um, and I could see mixing with this for sure. I think this would be good um, in certain cocktail recipes, especially if you want a, a light, kind of a cream note, a vanilla note. Um, it is very sweet, very I'm, simple. I'm going to throw in a random note that I'm just picking up on, like paper. It smells a little bit like I, there's like this tiny hint of like vanilla slash like paper or cardboard almost. So like if you open a box of like a ream like a ream of like uh, yeah. like you get from Hammer I kind of get that yeah hammer mill old world vodka yeah <laughs> it's it's not good. See I don't mind it but it, it's 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 harsh. It's very got a harshness harsh. it's harsh, which doesn't get the bitter. It smells like like. Paper and I'm not finding it that bitter, but I am finding it harsh. I, it, it reminds me of more of a vodka than a whiskey, honestly. Yeah, yeah, something like just very, yeah, very plain. You could easily use this in a cocktail that calls for vodka. I'd say two point three. Like I don't like it. My, my low bar is two. Anything under two, I would politely refuse. This, I would I would ask if there's anything else at the party. Oh, was it five is you're willing to drive to buy it, right? No, 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 eight. Oh, eight is you're willing eight to go out your willing, to buy it. Like, okay. Eight is, okay. like, this is good. I want this. Right. Five right. is, it's fine. It's bog standard. Two is, uh, I'd rather not if I had a choice. <laughs> um so I'm going 2.3. It's not quite the I'd rather not. Like, I'm going to finish the rest of my pour here. But, uh, yeah, not not great by mm -hmm. any stretch. All right, boys and girls, make sure you're entering your questions in. Let's get to answering questions and enough talking about subpar whiskeys, unless you're you Mac. Do it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we owe ourselves some Suntory at some point. So, so while you're finishing up that glass there, Rocky, what, what tartan are you wearing today? Oh, shoot. We didn't call each other. We wore the same tartan. Oh, snap, son. I'm like, um, so embarrassed. Ugh, ugh. Sorry. <laughs> still, still kicking Wait, down that, that whiskey. The... That was, oh. Yeah, I got one of them for that. <laughs> um, this, my friends, is the Kilts and Culture Tartan designed by yours truly with input from several around the shop. Da -da -da. Um, this is the tartan of the show slash of the... Facebook group of the same name, Kilts and Culture. Um, we do this one in PV. We did a limited run in wool. Um, we're not 100% sure. We're probably going to do another run in wool at some point. 
Um, you heard it here first. That's the first I've heard of that. Nah, there's been a, there's been a, a minor uprising in the group. Cool. Um, okay. <laughs> a lot of people uh, uh, crying that they didn't get in on the first one. Kilts and, and culture they want it. guys appreciate quality. <clears throat> yeah. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. I am. I'm loving it. I am so. Yeah. That sounded like a McDonald's commercial. Um, well, it does no, have it's, it is. It is right gorgeous. Here. It is really gorgeous. And thank you, Mac, for making this up. By the way, I appreciate it. Um, wait, did you make this one or did Ian make it? I Ian did not. Do it? Sewed okay. it. Yeah, okay. selling it. That, that would be uh, the other kilt maker that's over in the other room. Uh, Ian. Ian. Ian Sam. You know we okay. have more than one over there, right? Well, there's only one. Yeah. Oh uh, no, I guess yeah, she's still over there. Okay. Uh, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, all y'all did a great job. Yeah, so. it's I'm, I'm really pleased with how it came out. It's it's a nice weathered, uh, effectively standard weathered tartan palette with a slightly darker red um, than standard weathered. Yeah, but, but it's uh, colorful for weather. I mean, the the blue gray, it's it's vi it's weathered and yet vibrant. I don't know how it does. It's hard to, yeah, yeah. You gotta see it in person, I guess. But um, it's yeah. my new. It is it is potentially my new. Just based on design, it is probably my current new favorite. Um, I really dig it. The I don't know if I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag, but uh, what? I, I've I've done I've done something. I've done something, Eric. Dun dun dun. I, I go away from the building for like two months. <laughs> <coughs> this I'm, is what happens. Okay. I'm getting a pair of trues. You did mention that uh, actually. Yeah. Well, not trues. They're they're tartan pants. Okay, they're I was not, gonna say not tr trousers. Because yeah. the last thing I remember from a few oh. years ago was I that you trues. hated oh. trues. Yeah, the trues. The cut of the trues. Like it not was, flattering. Oof. Yeah, it was not flattering. Give me a front wedgie. You didn't like it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when <laughs> your boss, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's yeah. Don't like the cut of trues on myself. I'm trues in my mind are much much better suited for skinny guys. If yep. you're a man of substance like myself, um, a few extra pounds around the middle, um, trues are not great. So I, uh, but I still like. I still wanted it in a pair of tartan pants just to have it, just to play around. I think um, I think for trousers, a trouser cut, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but trues with the with the fishtail and the and and the, the skinny legs and everything. Yeah. Now no. the question is, should I wear it on the show? Sure. Well, uh, dun dun why dun. Don't we ask, why don't we ask these guys? Oh, fair. Let's see. Well, it's, they're not really going to see much. You're going to see me like sit down in a pair of pants. We can we can uh, have you model and we can put up an overlay. Well, we can show it enough. off. We got the tech. Enough. Well, Rescue Diver 007 on Twitch, Twitch! says no. No. <laughs> no, I have to just to piss off Rescue Diver. <laughs> um, now, nah, it's challenge it's, accepted. Yeah, exactly. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> Wait, did I just call my. Never mind. I don't know. I don't know either. All right. But anyway, I, it, it's cool. I could see for, for trousers. Definitely. I don't. I'm not a fan of trues either. I think they were meant for skinny military guys back in the 19th century, and that's where they should stay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're not that skinny military build guy, you look like Tweedledee or Tweedledum. Okay. Yeah. It's no offense. No, no, no. Not taken. I, I, I wouldn't wear. I am self-aware. Trust me. The uh, now I, I've retired that one pair immediately. Now, would you do? Uh, would you do a suit? Would you go so far as to do a tartan suit in this? I would totally do a, I, wa I I may totally may do not, a waistcoat in this. I may or may not have a waistcoat coming as well. <laughs> I should have known. I, I, I should have known. I forgot I ordered that too. I should have known. Yeah. I, have, I haven't ordered a uh, anything like kilt-wise or you know, tartan-wise for myself for a while. Yeah. So I was like, all right, screw it. I'm going to go all in. going to get it. Um, and then that way I'll have a nice, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I got the lapels. Yeah, man. Oh, magnifique. Next time we were able to go out. Yeah. You know, the now we just got to get through the Rona to uh, get on the other side of this happy. <sighs> fingers thing. crossed. Yeah. Get the stuff coming from uh, Scotland. So, indeed, Mr. Mac, it's been well, a while. Do you have any questions well, over there? Well, since we're we kind of touched on it here a little bit, we are yellow in the yellow phase now. We're out of out of the Ooh. red phase in the yellow. Um, there is some people asking us uh, what how we're holding up. What's the kind of this the status? Sure. Um, Crispy. <laughs> Personally. <Very crispy>. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to point some. Well, two days ago, we had a nice major storm that blew out power, blew out the interwebs, blew out the phones, blew out everything. Um, so we're back up and running, barely in time for the show. Um, but we got here. Um, currently, it's raining outside, 
and we have another storm coming through with lightning, thunder, the whole nine, and that's going to yeah. go on until midnight. So this is my word of caution. If it goes black, all of a sudden, we have not been bombed. It is the fact that lightning or something has struck and killed the stream. So um, Unless it's something you're drinking at home, in which case, yeah. yes. Good on you. No control over that. <laughs> Hopefully it's better than hot hotaki. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the uh, how are we faring? We're faring. Uh, we're ticking along. We, uh, uh, we are still skeleton crew in the shop. Uh, we're still skeleton crew in the back. We're still a few people from marketing, Eric included, working from home. And then we have uh, the store is still closed um, for now. Basically, what it boils down to is we have a lot of employees and spouses of employees who have uh, who are in the high risk category. Um, some of our employees are a little yeah. bit older. Some of our employees have asthma. Um, so we're trying to protect them as much as possible. So <clears throat> what we what we are planning on doing is the actual company itself goes into the yellow phase. Is it today officially? Today. Yeah. Today officially we are in yellow phase, which means that you're allowed. X number of people per capacity and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're going to kick it down the road for a little bit. Um, we're going to basically wait to see if there's another spike um, just to protect our employees here in the shop. The vast majority of our business is actually done online. So we encourage people to still shop on the website, obviously. Right. Um, Please. <laughs> at some point when we, uh, in a couple weeks to, you know, to a few weeks, end of the month, let's say, um, once we are firmly in the yellow phase and we're a little bit more you know sure of where we are in the recovery process then we're going to reopen the store for appointment only and have basically one customer at a time and then you know wipe down the store and all that kind of stuff um to keep as sanitary and as, as healthy as possible um but you know check our uh check our website for that check our facebook's for that give us a call we'll tell you where we're at in that process but uh yeah it's ultimately we're we're not scared of cats. It's one of those where it's like we got some people who we really don't want to kill, um, <laughs> or even incapacitate temporarily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the last thing we yeah, need right now is true. for you know Mac or any of his team to wind up having to yeah. be out of work, and then because we are getting orders out. I mean, we are producing kilts, but if if any of the staff that's able to work now got hit with something and was out of, out of work for unable to work for a couple of weeks, that yeah, <laughs> that'd that be would... a problem. Then we'd have more angry customers about, you know, yeah. where's my stuff? Um, so, yeah, that's about it. We want to uh, we want to stay safe. We want you guys to stay safe, and we want to keep kicking out orders. And, the as I said, the vast, the great vast majority of orders come from our website. So it's one of those where please order online, and then we'll see you in midsummer. Yep. So that's about that. God willing and the creek don't rise. Exactly. Yep. Should I do a question? Yes. Bring we'll it in. get to do a question. Woohoo! I haven't done this since March. Holy cow. Um, well, just a quick follow-up, actually. Philip Rains was asking, did we have any of the Cansey Tartan in PV cloth available still? Yes. Yeah, so, Yep. yes. The Kilts and Culture Tartan um, is one that we are going to, in theory, for as long as people want it, um, keep in stock in a polyviscous fabric. Um, wool will do, as, as the demand increases... We'll do a run every now and again. Um, I won't say it's going to be six months, yearly, bi-yearly, whatever. Um, it's basically when there's enough uh, capacity or enough demand to, mass. to tip over. Critical mass, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, yep, PV, we will keep in stock as long as you keep buying them. And I will say, as far as PV is concerned, uh, this would be an awesome great kilt. Yeah, I can yeah, definitely yeah. see. Yeah, it's got this, the uh, the Outlander beautiful. kind of vibe to it. Yeah, it was part of the the mm -hmm. thought process. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people really really dig on weathered tartans, so we wanted to, yeah. uh, especially in our group, um, we we got feedback on you know, hey, what kind of color palette do you guys want? Do you want something bright? Do you want something subdued? Do you want it dark? Um, do you want it weathered? Do you want it muted? And I would say the overwhelming majority was for weathered, and that's one of my favorite you know color palettes as well. Yeah. So that's kind of the Guilty. direction we went with it. Yeah. Yeah. So the the PV is slightly different due to the way that the, uh, due to the color, the, the stock yarns, stock yarn shades available from the polyviscose fabric versus wool. Right. Um, but it's it's still, they both came out very, very nice. I'm not, yeah. e I'm not even doing one of these. 
I was, I, I will be honest, I was scared to death that I was either going to love one or love the other or hate them both and hate, you know, it's, I was really scared how it was going to come out um, because we had sunk a lot of time and a lot of money into it. Um, but I'm now, very pleased. I want to get on to less self-referential questions, but yeah. real quick though, do you guys have a preference as to whether you prefer this plead to the stripe or the set at this point? Either. That's why I Because I know you designed it that way so it could go either, but have you looked at like, hmm, I really like it done to the to that stripe? Um I probably like it to the set better. It just it's it's okay. it's a it's a reasonably complex tartan. It is it's complex enough to be interesting, but not so complex that it's like a, a test pattern. Um <laughs> So I, I tried to find the balance between, like, you know, uh, Wallace or Montgomery, a very, very simple, simple tartan, or <laughs> Rob Roy McGregor, a very, very simple tartan. <laughs> Tablecloth. And something like Ogilvy, which is, like, crazy, over-the-top, you know, a ton of different color changes. Um, I wanted a nice, balanced tartan. Um, Scott Weathered was one of my inspirations for this as well, just based on the the, the balance that it has within that tartan. Um and uh, it was my wedding tartan as well, so it's another one that I hold near and dear. Um, so yeah, it's I really like how it came out, very very balanced, and I like the way pleating it to the set shows off the balance front okay. and back versus having it all done to the stripe in the back. I'm I'm fine pleating stripe or set. This one for myself, set. Cool. Okay. Yeah, we haven't gotten many as far as the, as far as the uh, eight yards go. We haven't gotten request. many yeah. uh, requests for the stripe. Um, okay. it, it definitely changes it drastically one way or the other, doing it to the white stripe or the the black yeah. uh, stripe with the white Yeah, darts. I would think it would. That's kind of why I was wondering what you guys would yeah. say. But Okay, cool. Indeed. Now, would you like me to do a question? Or sure. Or go to, to Mac's stuff now? Yeah, we'll do one of yours. Doing? Okay, then I'm going to go straight ahead <laughs> to uh, Keegan Reynolds, who's the next one on our list. Um... And they're asking, when you're making a kilt, what do you do with the leftover fabric? What do you do with the wastage? Great question. Um, if it's Snack. a wool kilt and there's leftover fabric, um, sometimes there is leftover fabric, sometimes there's not. So don't, <laughs> Max shaking his head violently. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is not a, yes, we will always do this. This is a, as material allows thing. If there's any leftover fabric, generally it's the section in the middle of the cloth, um, where we take the you know the 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 bottom half of the bolt of fabric and the top half of the bolt of fabric, flip it, splice it, and then hide that splice in the seam. We are left with a strip in the middle. That's generally used for the waistband, for matching flashes, occasionally stuff like that. Um, if there is anything left over, then we will include that. We actually wrap it up with a nice little uh, note saying, "Hey, yeah. if you want to if you want to color match something later on, here you go, little strip of your tartan." Um, there's not always something left. If you have a 54 inch bolt of fabric and you're an individual who needs a 26 inch length, 26 times two is 52. You have two inches and that's barely enough for the waistband. So sometimes there's literally nothing left. So we try to use as much of the cloth as possible so that there's as minimal scraps as possible um, as far as the waistband area. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not always, you know, there's not always, you know, cloth available to send the customers, but if there's something left over, we include it in the box as kind of a, a, a not a gift, but as a, oh. a gratis thing. They, you own it in our, yeah. the way we think of it is it's yeah. your fabric. So <clears throat> now for the polyviscose, we'll hold on to that thought oh. <laughs> for the polyviscose, <laughs> you don't own it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we use the middle sections. Um, from the polyviscous fabric, either for sashes, for stock, if we can fit it, um, or we'll use it for flashes or for waistbands or for other little bits and bobs. So in the polyviscous fabric, the bolt is 60 inches wide, and we try to use, again, trying to be as, as uh, uh, fastidious, or not as fastidious, um, frugal as mm -hmm. possible, um, try to use all the cloth as best we can um, so we're not wasting much. Okay. So that's not yours. <laughs> no PP for you. So, yeah. Um, but if in, in wool, if there's extra cloth, we pass it on to the customer. In PV, if there's extra cloth, you don't get it. That just goes into our stock and we use it for stuff. If you That being said, if you need 
a little strip of PV for a hand fasting or whatever um, out of the same tartan as the kilt you are ordering, then just put a note in the put a note on the order or send us an email and say, "Hey, I just ordered a semi-traditional kilt for my wedding. Would you mind including a little strip of cloth um, for the hand fasting?" And we'll happily do that for you. Yeah, and even if you don't envision a use for a wool scrap that we send you, do hold on to it because you never know if a few years down the road you're going to want to get something that's matching or even just buy something out in the world that is a good color match for the tartan. And having that piece to just take with you or to snip off and then mail back to us or to another vendor, very handy. It takes all the guesswork out. So yep. do hold on to it if you have a piece. If I'm going shopping for shirts yeah. or if you're going shopping for a wedding for your... Uh, for a shirt or for ties for the groomsmen or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, or for dresses for the bridesmaids. Um, that's partially why we give you that scrap. It's a lot easier to take a small scrap of fabric to a store than it is to take a full kilt to a store. Yeah. Um, so if I need to buy a shirt that I want to match to a particular kilt or at least tone well with a kilt, I'll bring the fabric with me. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Hope that helps. Mr. Mac. All right, so we have. I think I think Eric will like this question. Uh oh. We have Alabama Fisher of really Men like on YouTube. Okay. Asking, are there any accounts uh, known of pirates wearing a kilt? Also, are there any mm. famous or infamous, should I say, Scottish pirates? <sighs> Piracy is not my strong suit. Um, there have been, I know. This is a good stumper. Uh, I like this question um, because I can't really answer it very well, um, which means I get to go read stuff. The um, There have been a couple of times when lithographs have shown up from the 17th century or early 18th century where it looks like uh, someone on board ship is wearing what seems to be a kilt. Most of the time, it turns out that basically what you're actually seeing is the, uh, the voluminous fabric of uh, the coat that was in fashion at the time, either, either the... Um, not the doublet, but the but the, the the coat that was being worn, or occasionally it's a Turkish coat. It's something, you know, it's just a flamboyant piece of clothing, or it's artist interpretation. Um, was there tartan on the high seas in the Caribbean? Almost certainly, somebody had some because it, you know, even if it's not as kilt, uh, plaid is a popular fabric. Um, Scottish pirates, I cannot address. I do know that a good number of the famous pirates. Um, in the 17th and 18th century were from Ireland um, or of Irish extraction. I'm sure there were some Scots also, but basically the maritime tradition of Ireland um, as well as economics led to a lot of people winding up in the West Indies and becoming uh, buccaneers uh, and then later on pirates. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there's some names that I don't know. Most of my knowledge of piracy comes from a really cool podcast called the Pirate History Podcast, which I highly recommend. There's more data in there than I could possibly remember in a thousand years. Um, really, really good podcast. Um, but yeah, there's a there's definitely an Irish connection to piracy. I'm not so sure about the Scottish one. You guys know any cool <clears throat> pirate podcasts or anything pirate book yeah. related yeah tag it in the comments but there's no there's no strong evidence of somebody wearing a kilt uh in the west indies or anything um like i said there's some pictorial evidence where people think hey it looks like they're wearing a kilt but it's actually it's just the the coattails of what they were wearing yeah. being bunched up around a weapons belt or something like that you i've know. never i've never heard of it so i'd say yeah, if no. it was if it happened it was by far the exception not the norm um yeah so there may have been a random Scottish dude who happened to own a kilt who was on a particular pirate ship, but uh, I would not say it's the thing. It, 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 it defies my personal sense of logic <clears throat> in it because the um, wool's not suited, wool's not suited exactly for suited Caribbean. to the Caribbean. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and it would not last <clears throat> very long under those conditions. Um, they wound up wearing very little clothes most of the time, just because of the heat and everything. You know, so linen pants and a shirt. Yeah. You know. They probably smelled great, too. Uh, if you all smell the same, you don't know so much. I mean, that's what they say. But, uh, but yeah. It's a very good question. It makes me curious 
if there is anything, but I don't think there's much. Yeah. Fair enough. Hmm. Mr. Eric, let's do another one from the uh, the preloaded bits. Sure, sure. I'm going to drink some water so I don't sweat so much. Oh, it's hot in here. Okay. Uh, another techie question. Um, Joe Groves is asking us, is there a standard amount of kilt that should be viewable <coughs> above your kilt belt? Is there a standard amount of material? Yeah, like what's the, what should, what's the proportion? A viewable like, above your kilt is belt. This, is this correct? Is this about right? Or is this should be more like that? Or I, I'd say yay. About yay much. You're way over there, but I think you're holding like a, what, half inch or an inch? About, eh, about three quarter. Three quarter um, inch? Basically yeah. the, the width of the waistband. Um, shouldn't be much more than that. Uh, the, the kilt belt goes around near the top of the kilt. Um, around the widest part of you, basically around the rise, so it's the the, 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 the straight up and down sewn section. Um, you don't need a kilt belt on to hold up the kilt, but if you choose to wear one, it goes near the top. Um, yeah, it's 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 personal preference. There's no, I'm not going to get out a ruler and you know beat you across the, the the head and shoulders with it if you're if you're wearing it a little bit too low <laughs> or a little bit too high. I just had this vision of you as a nun. From my high school. In, in my habit, pretty. the full on penguin mode. No! Oof. Kneel on these peas. Oh. Frozen peas, yeah. Ah. Or the, the curtain no, rod I mean, or whatever. I think there are a number of reasons why a kilt belt is the width it is, but I think part of it is the fact that it is by design, it fills up the space between um, your hip bone and the top of the rise of the kilt. It's designed to fill that space aesthetically, so it is designed to fit in the rise of the kilt. So. Yeah, it just, it just naturally, whenever I put one on, it just naturally turns out to be about, you know, yeah. na anywhere it between a quarter, put. yeah, a quarter of an inch, not a quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch to three quarters of an inch. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's like the only like wild card, for lack of a better term, is the top of the buckle. Sometimes it might be a touch yes. above the waistband, yes. touch below, as, it, right near the top. Yeah, depending on how yeah. 3D the buckle is, how funky it is. Well, how how tall it is, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some are a little bit taller than others. So I have my wrestling champion buckle on that exactly. totally Texas covers up yeah. yeah that covers up the top of the the rise yeah. completely wear a, a hubcap sometimes mm -hmm. my kilt belt right right on honda <laughs> maybe, maybe not <laughs> mr I missed, mac i missed this <laughs> <laughs> drinking and coffee and questions we got one coming in from twitch, twitch! <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. i'm gonna peg the mic again <laughs> Sorry, everyone, for screaming at the microphone. Yeah, thanks, thanks. We'll get to edit that later. Yep. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Not very much. Well, you already gave Coraline some uh, artwork to do with uh, Rocky uh, as, as dressed as a nun. nun. So. Yeah. Nun with a <laughs> Honda hubcap belt buckle. <laughs> I want I want to state for the record that we do take this material seriously, and we do get into a lot of silly shenanigans here. But the data is, we do care about the data. <laughs> the so. data is there. The scotch helps the funny parts. I think, I think the funny parts are the sugar. For the pill, in a way. Yes. It's a lot of hard data, pill. and we don't want to be, we don't want to be like professors up here with a chalkboard being Take like, your Scottish medicine. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be good for yeah. you. Yeah. You don't want to be the kilt pope, so, to continue the Catholic. Now I want to have there. a Honda <laughs> pack. <laughs> no, you're graphic not the kilt now. pope. <laughs> anyway. Do I get it like a crook or something? <laughs> Shepherd's crook? There you go. I forgot the name for it. I don't know. The, the pope baton? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mac. How did you give us a question? All right, so he's uh, washed his great kilt, 16 ounce wool, uh, the way washed. we described How in one of in one of our videos with the bathtub method. Okay. Okay. Uh, the wool got Cold. what temperature water? I doesn't say that. Okay. Okay. Um, did I mention that temperature? You water? did not. Shoot. Wash it in cold water. Go ahead. He Mac. said the wool got quite uh, uh, got quite rougher to the touch. Is this normal for wool over time, or did yeah. something go wrong? How could I remedy it? Um, a, cold water. Um, so, I don't know if we need to go back and put a little note in there or kill that video. Um, the, the rougher nap... He said it was almost cold. Almost cold. Okay, okay that's fine. Okay. Um, yes, good. The, uh, the nap is, like, basically the, the little tiny hairs. Wool, wool yarn is made up from individual tiny hairs of wool. And as you wet them, they're going to kind of, if they have like little, you know, the little ends as it's twisting around the yarn, is going to kind of like lift up. So you're going to get the nap, which is like, you know, the, the fluffiness of it, so to speak. Yeah. Um, that will happen a little bit. It happens on, you know, my eight yard wool kilts 
when I wet wash them in a wash or in a you know in a bathtub or whatever. Um, and when you iron it, it kind of lays it back down. It flattens it back out. So I'd say ironing it would help with that. Um, it's you're just kind of relaxing the wool. What kind of ironing? Can you describe how you would recommend you do the ironing to make sure he doesn't? Fair point. Um, if you're going to iron it, um, I would use a press cloth, which is basically take a, a white handkerchief um, or something, you know, natural color. Don't use something that's, you know, red or blue or something like that. Um, get it wet and then, you know, take it, put it on the cloth, you know, wring it out so it's a little, it's damp. Put it on the cloth and then iron that section that will, you know, uh, basically make that water turn to steam and it will heat up that area, steam it, and it'll kind of you know, flatten out the, the nap as it were, of the uh, of the wool. Now that's going to be, I'm sorry, that's going to be a lot of a lot of work for a great kilt. Yep. Could you could you maximize? Could you like do like a damp pillowcase or a bed sheet or something to try and yeah, make yeah, it more efficient a process? Yeah, it's really it boils down to the surface area that they need that they're able to iron on. Yeah. So if they're ironing on like a regular ironing board, like most regular ironing have. board, yeah, there's there's not a lot. So a pillowcase would be good. You could use a bed sheet if you wanted to it's you would just have to have a huge have surface to, to iron on do not iron on your rug because you could if it's a, a, a if it's a, no. a synthetic fiber you could melt that and then it'll stick to the bottom um i don't know if i'd even iron it on the bed because you're pushing on something it's that was my next question yeah it's not it's but. not fun to iron on don't iron on a uh a piece of plywood because there's glue in plywood that could you know come out um we used to we bought a big uh, at the shop, um, way, way back in the day, before we had a, a vacuum ironing table, we had a big piece of melamine we got at Home Depot. <clears throat> it was a 4 by 8 sheet of melamine and press board in the middle. And we used to iron that because we could actually, like, press on it. Um, the, the steam didn't go through it well, but you could actually put pressure on it. So that would be okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think... Anything else for ironing? Mac, do you have any tricks for... What temperature should the iron be at? Um, you didn't mention that. The lowest steam setting. Okay. Um, so, like, middle, on wool setting. Okay. Um, Mac, do you have any tricks? No, everything you're, everything you're saying there is is pretty much what we've what I've done. Just e either use a spray bottle sometimes to help sp and spray it mm -hmm. down that way. Yeah. Um, uh, apparently, he's, he said, what about ceramic floor tiles? So, I'm guessing either he... Mm. ironed it on the floor or is thinking mm. about that i don't know the if that... problem i would have with ceramic floor tiles the grout portions is... right you have a gap you... correct mm. um is where where are the the floor tile you know where the edges and then there's the grout underneath so where the two tiles don't quite meet each other you could end up shining or getting a line mm -hmm. on the uh on the tartan if you're if you're too hot of a setting on the iron um yeah you end up with a <laughs> A different type of gridular pattern on the front there. Um, <laughs> the tartan within the tartan. Perhaps perhaps less of a problem with the great kilt, I suppose, based on, I don't know how he's wearing it. I'd say it, this, with a great kilt, do you need to iron it? Well, uh, if the scratchiness is bothering him, if he's raised the nap enough that he's finding it irritating, then yeah. Fair um, point. My, and I'm not trying to quiz, really, but my curiosity would be why uh, you felt it needed to be washed in the first place, because um, wool... And tartan wool coming from the mills, um, the mills we deal with at least, um, it's treated pretty well for stain resistance to begin with. Um, and honestly, wool will shed odor also. So if a, if a disaster happened, like somebody spilled mead and wine or something all over your kilt, then I could see washing it. But to some degree, I'm going to recommend for a great kilt, don't wash it if you absolutely don't have to. The you know, I... it's. In his defense, I will say this. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, there must have been some circumstance. Well. I'm not trying to throw <clears> him <throat> under the bus or anything. Albanock. Yeah. <laughs> they wear great kilts. Yeah. They sweat a lot. Yeah. So I cannot imagine being an on-tour band with clothes that you don't wash after you sweat in but, day okay, after day but, after day. Okay, after Mac. Day. Wool. Uniforms. Does it retain the odor badly, in your opinion? or? Um, no. How bad do you stink? Uh, That's... <laughs> On a scale of one to hell, with um, it, sulfurous. If we're doing Gettysburg uh, in July, um, 
it will it will have an odor for a little bit, but yeah. by the time I bring it back out to use it again, it's gone away. That's kind of my point. Um, we we typically don't, at least I typically don't wash any of my wools. I don't touch anything that touches the skin. So the yeah. shirts, drawers, I'll, yeah. I'll wash those, but anything else I don't wash. Yeah, That's kind of where I was going to go with it next, was what is he wearing? What are you wearing underneath the great kilt? Are you wearing a shirt up top? Are you wearing drawers underneath? Um, or are you, you know, regimental um, and bare-chested? Um, the more sweat and oils specifically that are transferred into it, then the more it may get an odor. Um, but if it's if, you, if yeah. you're wearing a a, a, a Hanes t-shirt or whatever, like a, a, an, an undershirt and a pair of underwear with it, it's it's less likely that like that's going to get wet before anything else. Yeah, I'm. And just my experience with wool garb is that it really doesn't need much. It really, maybe even just like a rinsing, you know, just to just to get some of the, the salt minerals out if you want. Yeah. But um, um, yeah, if you are doing a Highlander. Get up. Um, linen is definitely your friend. Um, cotton Highland shirts are nice, but linen is far better. Um, and you will also find, if you look at the the very period shirts, like 18th century and 17th century, they're pretty long. Um, it's almost like you got a slip. By design. <laughs> By yeah. design, yes. Yeah. Um, which lends some credence to the story that sometimes they would throw the kilts off before they ran into battle um, for freedom of movement. And the reason they would feel comfortable doing that is because the shirt is coming practically down to their knees. Um, that's more anecdotal than hard evidence, so don't quote me on it. But my point is, linen is absolutely your friend for historical clothing. Um, and I hope it works out. I'm sorry if the nap has made it uncomfortable for you, but I hope it's not too much of a hassle to try and get it flattened out again. You, you're, 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 you're... Cheshire cat like grin back there, Mac. <laughs> he said, if we have to know, a <clears throat> seagull gave him a gift, if you know what I mean. Uh, say again? <laughs> a seagull. Gave him a gift. Ah, yes. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Indeed. Happens. Birds. Happens. In that case, I would recommend spot cleaning, as opposed to running the whole through whole thing through the bathtub treatment. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Mr. Eric, next one. Who me? Okay. Um, I'm gonna switch over to from kilts to culture, and I want to give a shout out to Lucas who asked this question uh, in the group. This is great. Um, thank you for doing this. He said we'd had, we tend to get a lot of technical questions about kilts, not as many culture, pure culture questions. So what he wanted to know was how did the relationship between pubs and pub music, note the air quotes, um, arise and what sort of Irish, Scottish, Celtic music do we enjoy? Sure. So, you know, what's the story behind <clears throat> the Celtic music scene? Ah, yes. The pubs. Yeah. Um, pub is effectively short for public house. Um, way back when, and I won't quote a date because I don't know, um, the, uh, there was two effectively types of houses. There was private houses and public houses. Public houses meaning a bar or a hotel or somewhere where you could go to sleep or somewhere you go to drink. So the public house is zoned effectively for people to go there and hang out and drink. Um, and a lot of these, especially in small villages, um, became the, the, the community center. It was the place to gather, the place to hang out, the place to talk to each other, the place to enjoy the, the fellowship of your community. Yep. So that's where it kind of started was just, you know, going there to hang out and drink. And since there were a, 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 a definitive lack of jukeboxes back in the 1700s, <laughs> um, music was man-made. You didn't have <laughs> records. You didn't have that. You didn't have DJs. You had people bringing music to the pub to hang out and just, you know, make merry. Yeah. So, essentially, you had, uh, yeah, from my perspective, it goes back to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. You basically had uh, three, maybe four opportunities to hear music. One was you went to church. Two was you went to a big seasonal festival, which is maybe, like, in the middle of summer. Or maybe one in the spring, maybe one in the fall. Um, three, uh, singing at home. And four, singing with your friends. Um, and so, yeah, basically the, the music that we consider pub music now, um, folk music, well, folk means people. It is literally people's music, you know? I mean, all that stuff, it's basically, it's songs 
that you'd sing while you're working. It's songs you'd sing with your friends. It's music you'd enjoy when you're trying to relax, um, to tell stories, to preserve memories, you know, of, of your of your people's experience. It's music of the people, and I think that's why that's why it becomes associated with pubs because that's where the people meet, like mm -hmm. you just said, and uh, that's also why even to this day, it's very much, you know, very earthy music. Um, it's not music for the sake of being art, you know, it's music for the sake of feeling good and, and we're taking the blues away, you know, as, as rocking out. Yeah. As part of, as part of your community. Yeah. So it's um, fun. It's, it's there, voluntary. That's why there's so many sing-alongs. It's yeah. like, it's absolutely, it's, it's the, uh, uh, it's why session music ex exists in Ireland. I remember going to Ireland, uh, with Kelly and we just, we, we went, we specifically were looking for a session night at a pub in uh, uh, County Clare. I forget the name of the town we were staying in. Um, not Doolin, that's where we tried to travel. Um, but anyway, we just went Ennis. Um, we went into town <clears throat> and you know, asked the, uh, the place we were staying, you know, where's the best uh, pub music, where's the best session music on you know, Wednesday nights or whatever night it was. And they said, okay, go to this tavern. And we just went there with the camera, put the camera on the table and just you know, kind of waited around. And by... 30 um, people were just filing in with instruments just hanging right. out and right. we sat up near the fire there was peat logs going there were peat bricks going there was you know people in you know, with fiddles tin whistles they're bowering you know just kind of hanging out just playing music Legit. and it was a straight up like awesome just session music we just hit record put a Guinness in front of the camera for effect <laughs> and I got to find that film the uh, it was you know there's literally a peat fire burning like five or six musicians and a shot of Kelly's Pine of Guinness. Um, and it's, it is a fun, like weird social experience where it's not like there, there was no singing or anything like that for this particular one. It's just a nice atmosphere. Now, did they, now I got, I asked, did they, um, was it just like pro or semi-pro musicians who were doing the music or did it kind of go around the room? I have no idea. Okay. It's just people just randomly showed up and just started playing. Okay. So it's probably some of both. Kind of a bit of a mix. Um, yeah, 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 they, yeah. No one. There was. There was not organized. It was. It was. It was like heavenly. It was just kind of. It formed and happened, but nobody said like you know. Hey, John, come on up. It's time for you. It, like there was none of that. It was yeah. just people filed in, and if you're a musician, you sat over there with the other musicians, and if not, and it's it was over a course of an hour plus. Like a couple people came in or left in the middle of it. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, it was an organic yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really, really cool experience. Um, it happened more, uh, uh, at least in the places we went in Ireland than in Scotland. Um, and the other thing I remember was a, a little old, a little old guy at the bar, um, rode his bike to the pub and just started, you know, saw our video camera came over and started talking to me and Kelly and, you know, said, oh, let me buy around and just sat down and just started talking to him. And it was just completely random, friendly, all inclusive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There was no, you know, no politics, no nothing. He was interested in like our story, why we were visiting. We were asking him about his you know, family history and where he's been and what he does and all right. that kind of stuff. It's just a fun social thing. Yeah, it's basically, uh, I think session music, sessions or music sessions, uh, the term session is there for a reason. It's a it's a block of time. Um, it's a formalization of something which would normally happen spontaneously. Um, and in a modern age, it's more necessary to make it a formalized thing so you can make sure people will show up because we all have busy, hectic lives. And, you know, you might live in the village, but your job is, you know, down in the city. Who, who the hell knows? Or if there's a DJ, but, make sure people don't show up. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, prior to that, um, as much as I have some issues with the movie The Quiet Man for being kind of a little bit too simple. A little deal um, the, When they show people in the pub just hanging out and the guy's got an accordion and people start doing folk songs, that's what happened. That was your entertainment. You didn't have any other options. So it really is, it's village life in a nutshell. Um, in in my lexicon, um, in the SCA and, and other activities, we call the bardic circle. And very often it's, you'll have some people who are very used to performing as musicians or storytellers, um, but it's open. Anybody who wants to can jump in and say, oh, I got a song or I got a story to tell you. Um, and it's very much a social glue. Um, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of, and Lucas does this now with the with the, the, the piping community. You know, when he goes to the, the Piper's Collegium or whatever they call it, 
um, they will have after the formal lessons are over. They just hang out and they jam, and that's that's where so much of things we have now in the mass media come from is just those jam sessions. Like punk rock and Celtic rock is all based on jam sessions. You know, um, that's it's it's organic. I guess is, is what I'm saying. So, given that, what do you think about contemporary Celtic music, which is a broad term, or folk music? Do you have any favorites? Or do you have any? I mean, you're you're a dropkick guy from way um, back, I know. So you got yeah, the punk angle, yeah, yeah. right? It's, I, I will, I will say this. Um, you know, don't write letters. Um, the dropkicks, <laughs> dropkicks has started to get away a bit from the Celtic thing, to a degree. It sounds more poppy than it yeah. does. Like they've, they've, they've evolved as musicians, and I've, I'm kind of left a little bit off on that journey myself. Um, I didn't follow them as closely recently. They did the Fenway thing, and that was pretty cool with Bruce Springsteen at the end. Right. Um, so I still I still enjoy them, but it's not to me what it was. Um, it's like Kilmaine too, Saints. It's a bit too polished. Kilmaine Saints are great. Great um, example over there. Um, another band that I've kind of I've liked the evolution of is the Real Mackenzies. They went from yes. like straight punk, Celtic punk music. And they've kind of evolved as they, or more to the point, Paul, has gotten older. Um, and they've kind of slowed down a little bit more of a rock vibe than a yeah. punk vibe. Yeah. Um, but it's still entertaining. It's still cool. They did a lot of like acoustical type songs. They did a whole acoustical album. Yep. Um, yep. So I like the different angles they're throwing at it. Um, uh, Flatfoot, another good band. Um, Kilmaine Saints, Flatfoot we had 56. in the studio here. Yep. Yeah, Flatfoot 56, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good music, and there's a lot of good local music. I mean, like, if you're... Uh, check out your your local Irish bars, and a lot of times if you have a good local Irish bar, they may have local Irish musicians. Um, yeah. like, down in, like down in Philly, we have the Hooligans, we have the Bogside Rogues, we have the Shanties. There's a lot of good local Irish bands mm -hmm. um, that, that do well. Clancy's Pistols, another one. Um a lot of cool local bands. So now I don't know what they have in Chicago or LA or anywhere else in the world or in, in the U S but a lot of major cities will have multiple, especially cities with a, a high Irish percentage. Mm -hmm. Um, will have a lot of cool Irish musicians. I think, I think the, um, I had one, one recommendation and then I'm going to change it up a little bit, but, uh, for background, I was raised more on the folk side of things. My parents were huge fans of like silly wizard. You know who those are? You're, who that is? You're showing your age, um, and uh, Clancy Brothers and stuff like that. Um, right now, probably my absolute favorite folk band is Emar, um, who are kind of like a super group in some ways, um, based in Scotland but very much Irish style music. They're amazing. I highly, highly recommend checking them out. Um, and I think there's, there's, you can find new music in all these scenes we're talking about either through podcasts um, or next time you're going to a festival or going out on St. Patrick's Day, make some notes. Keep your phone handy and jot down the name of that band or take a photo of the poster because um, especially at a big festival like Celtic Classic, you know, our home turf, yeah, um, you can sample the, the latest folk music as well as the latest rock music um, all in one setting. It's fantastic. So it's um, keep exploring, I guess is all I want to say. Yeah, there, and There's a lot, a lot of stuff out there that is not the stuff you're going to get from the big names that are on like Xfinity or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I would say this, the, the music is how the culture survives. Yeah. So it's, that's how stories are passed down. That's how things, Absolutely. you know, go on is through music. Um, and with the way the music industry is in upheaval, shall we say in the past 15 years or so, um, supporting smaller musicians, local musicians, cool musicians, different musicians, yep. um, directly and learning about musicians going to festivals and things like that. It's a great place to uh, kind of expand your own horizons and mm -hmm. kind of check out some new stuff. Um, and I, I think it's still going on, but there's also a, um, an NPR radio show called Thistle and Shamrock, or Shamrock and Thistle, I forget. But basically they do a weekly installment, and it's basically a, what's happening, that what's hot right now in the Celtic music scene, both Scottish and Irish and elsewhere. Um, there's that's podcasts a, with the, like, there's podcasts the... Podcasts uh, are great, yeah. What's the, what's the Irish... Irish punk podcast. Um, it's escaping me now, and now I can't remember the name of it. Huh. Um, okay. I don't know what you're talking about either. From, from Chicago. Okay. Um, 
Darn it. The Tossers from Chicago, another good band. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but there's there's Irish music podcasts. There's Celtic punk podcasts. There's a lot of different yeah. stuff out there that'll expose you to some really, really cool Podcasts are, are definitely the way to go and get to a festival. Go see as many bands as you can and buy merch. It's the only way bands make any money these days is through merchandise. So please buy T-shirts, buy yeah. CDs, even if you don't use them. <laughs> buy stickers, buy patches. Pass it on to somebody else. Listen to it a couple times, exactly. throw it on your iTunes, exactly. and give the CD to somebody yep. else. Yep. Yeah, I'd, I'd say there's there's more Celtic music out there now than at any time in history. So it's, it's a good time for it. But yeah, I mean, I, but I like the classics. Like I said, you know, Clancy Brothers, Silly Wizard. Um, who else do my folks listen to? Clannad. Chieftains. Chieftains, yeah. 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 They get to that point where they're so big that they've done all kinds of... Wolf Tones. Wolf Tones. Another yep. great one. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, we didn't even touch on metal or, or um, Celtic, yeah, Celtic it's rock like, or anything. It's, really. it's weird how Irish music specifically has kind of, like, like a vine, invaded... <laughs> all these other the musical genres, of music, if you will. I know the, uh, but it's they kind of like just get their hooks into different things, and it's neat how different yeah. genres like fold in Irish traditional Irish instruments or songs or yeah. hell, Metallica did "Whiskey in the Jar." Right. I mean, like, right. how much bigger can you get the Metallica doing an Irish song? Right. Um, so it's it's neat. In some ways, it's horrible. In other ways, it's, it's spectacular it's not to see. Um, <laughs> To see different genres of music kind of uh, just embracing all that is Celtic culture or some of what is Celtic culture. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Boy, that was a shaggy dog. Pretty much. That's what well, you, you get when you talking ask a, about music. You ask a cultural question, yeah. that's what's going to happen. But but yeah, I, absolutely. Get out there and support the scene, whichever angle of it you're interested in. 100%. Mr. Yeah. Mac. All right. So years. we're going to we'll go with another uh, culture question here. Ruh roh. We've got not a, pirates, I hope. <laughs> no, not yeah, pirates this time. Left. <laughs> uh, so we have Jared asking, uh, he was wondering, what would be a valid reason for the Irish to depart Ireland, mainly Ulster to come to the colonies during the mid-16th century? Uh, he says he, he finds it interesting that the Flins, who he, he's a descendant of, were apparently rich in land during that time period, and they were sponsoring immigration. Mm -hmm. Emigration or immigration? Meaning... They were sponsoring people to leave Ireland. I'm assuming the way the way it came. Got it. Um, Money. Um, 16th century religious oppression. Uh, yes. Um, 16th century. It depend. It depends a little bit what time you're talking about. That's pretty early, um, very early for colonizing in the Americas. But yeah. um, uh, Queen Elizabeth had a campaign against the Irish, though. Um, she had the Irish Wars. Um, don't quote me on the. I don't remember the dates, to be honest. I just know that she was there. Um, so, yes, having your land forfeited to the British crown uh, or the English crown could be a reason to emigrate. Um, but people, Landlords kicking people off their land. Yeah, but that really came more into its the full... That came. Whatnot. That's much later. Um, going back that far, I think you're looking at the mercantile interest. You're looking at the fact that um, it really literally was a new world and everybody was trying to find a way to, to make hay out of it. The streets um, are paved with gold, I tell you. Yeah, there weren't any streets yet, but you know, <laughs> but the but that tobacco stuff is pretty popular. Um, and yeah, I think it was basically it was about um, uh, making a buck. You know, it's uh, I think I think there was probably pressure because of the English campaigns in Ireland at the time under Elizabeth. Um, it didn't get really bad until the 17th century with Cromwell, um, uh, his campaigns in Ireland, which were an outgrowth of the English Civil War. Um, or the War of the Seven States, I think they call it, is the other name for it. Or no, Three Kingdoms, War of the Three Kingdoms. Um, but that early on, it's really it's really about trying to expand your holdings. Personal empire. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Seamus, making a buck. One Pretty of much. The, uh, Pretty much. One of the original uh, you know, people to emigrate from Ireland. Oh, I see what you did there. Yes. Making a buck. That's, yeah. Well, you said make it a buck, and I just kind of chuckled because it sounded very much like a last name, like a single word. <laughs> Seamus, make it a buck. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, my God. Don't write letters. If you do, Please write don't. Focus. I am not responsible for that one. But, yeah, um, I'm sure there are they're individual stories, <clears throat> um, and there's always population pressure if you have an aggressor, you know, and you have religious differences, which you still did very early on again, but you did have that between Protestant and Catholic. But I think the main issue was trying to make something out of the new world. Everybody wanted to copy the Spanish or take some gold from the Spanish, if you could. 
or, so. or go to an go to an area where there's a ton of opportunity. Yeah. Period. It's it's yeah. it's wide open. Yep. They're like, okay, fine, I can go over there and get you know five times the amount of land for the same amount of money, or you know, I can I can do all these different things, and I have an idea how to start a business. Slight, it's, slight issue with it not being your <clears> land <throat> and belonging to the people who currently live there, but they, ah, they weren't details, concerned about details. that. Details. Yeah. Um. So the uh, but yeah, it's it's yeah. For on a on a personal level, if you're looking for your family history, I'd say we can give you kind of broad brushstrokes, but we're not the place for individual family histories. But it's mm. it's we can give you some some thoughts, some general thoughts on it. I think, but I do think, yeah, it's uh, but yeah, you want to look into the history of the colonies, colonization. Yeah, I think you'll find it's pretty much all about money. Well, this is that. awesome. I got. I want to go home and read. <laughs> wow, Mr. Mac. Alrighty, so we have, where did it go? Um, we have Christian on Facebook asking, I was told that Royal Stort is not a true universal tartan and should only be worn by British subjects or the Commonwealth citizens. Is this true? Uh, no. Are you thinking of... Um... What not is, what's Balmoral. The, yeah, Bal the Balmoral the, tartan. Balmoral maybe she is. is the royal, specifically the royal tartan that yeah. no one's supposed to weave. Um, <clears throat> no, there it's, it's it, you can lump in black watch into this type of discussion as well. Is that really a military tartan, or is it for anyone to wear universal because it's it's so widespread? Um, the royal Stuart, at the at the latest, I would say the latest, where it kind of became a <clears throat> a universal symbol. It very well may have happened earlier than this, but at the latest it became a universal symbol was in the late 70s with the punk rock rebellion. Um, basically, Vivian Westwood and all the punk rockers in the UK wearing tartan as a, you know, a thumbing their nose to the British crown saying, you think this is yours? We're going to take it too. For it's Royal Stuart specifically. I mean, yeah. it was supposed to be emblematic of the royals. It wasn't restricted, but it was supposed to be a tartan of the crown of the people of England, right? I, I mean, don't know. I don't know how it had a perception. At least it was a nothing. Perception, it, yeah, yeah, but I don't know how how firm that was. I don't think it was. But yeah, it's. But yeah. I don't know enough historically to say that. But I would say by the late seventies, early eighties, um, it was the the you know the horse had left the barn. Um, it was right. it was everywhere. Punks were using it. You know, fashion designers were using it. Everyone was using it. So it was one of those where you can't say, no, you're not allowed to anymore because everyone already was. So it yeah. was, it, it just evolved. It became what it was going to be, mm -hmm. um, which was a universal tartan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's basically, and that's why there's so many variants of it also. Um, Royal Stuart has been, has more color variants to it than any other. Well, no, I, I'd really. say, I wouldn't say color. I'd say there are bastardizations of it. Okay. There are a ton like of fashion versions, shall we say? Yes. Yeah. Um, I like kerosene. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there aren't yeah, a lot of tartan. <clears throat> there yeah. actually aren't a lot of color variations of it. Okay. There are. It's basically modern color palette. You know, I have a a weathered Royal Stuart, but La Karen doesn't do a weathered. Yeah, but is it, it's, isn't Stuart black is basically Royal Stuart just with the black field? That's a different and... version. It's a different tartan. It's not a okay, different... Okay, that's what I was trying to say. Okay, Th then so, then yes, there are... I apologize for semantics issues, no, but... No, understood. Um, so I'd say, yes, there's black Stuart, there's navy Stuart, there's... It, Camel. It's, that's that's really a different tartan. It's, it, it's, okay. It's, if it's a color variation, they changed a lot of colors. But it became um, so... The point is, Royal Stuart was so ubiquitous and so much... I think yeah, it's well like known. it's the original universal tartan, you could say, in a way. That or Black Watch, one of the two. It's, yeah, okay. It's right there. Okay. But, uh, yeah, there's nothing there's nothing weird about it in terms of yeah. legality or convention, shall we say, or anything yeah. like that. And at this point, it's, will you still get the occasional, now going switching over to Black Watch, will you still get the occasional person saying, you weren't into Black Watch, you shouldn't be wearing that? Possibly. That's ridiculous. Yes, but at that point... It's it's what's that person gonna break into every person's bedroom with flannel pajamas and flannel sheets and flannel boxers and say you can't wear mounted flannel boxers. Mounted on LL beans. Yeah, I know. Are they gonna scream at LL bean like just you know <laughs> howl at the moon? Go ahead. Um, it's it's you're 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 shadow boxing with clouds. Uh, the uh, yeah. it's people will take offense that want to take offense. There's nothing you can do now, to stop that. Do you know Do you know what the provenance of 
uh, Royal Stewart is, like when it was designed? No, that I okay. offhand. No, I could do okay. research on it, but yeah, no, I don't know that right off the top of my head. Because it, it 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 happened at some point, but I, I it has to be something that somebody came up with as this is cool and this feels Prince Charlie royal. wore something similar. Bonnie Prince yeah. Charlie. Um, his, his set was like a little bit off and has a smaller red square, which is the huh. Prince Charles Edward Stewart okay. set. That's right, right over your off. shoulder? So it was possibly... What? Right over his shoulder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the shop mm -hmm. behind me. Um, the, so there's, there's possible that it's a reasonable age, mm. um, but it's not... Not something I know off the top of my head when Royal Stewart want, was Yeah, I want to look it up. And it's, it, it's one of those things where it's like it's so obvious you'd think it would be like the first thing you learn when you start getting into this stuff, and yet yeah. you just kind of like gloss over it because it's everywhere. But I feel like it must have been designed for somebody to wear for now, an occasion. Or was it called and Royal then, Stewart or was it called Stewart? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. But, Damn it. But there's nothing wrong with wearing it. There's uh, What I'm finding is the first published version of it was in 1831. Did it have anything to do with what uh, George the Fourth wore for his trip um, to Scotland? Officially, the tartan was worn by Black Watch Pipers, Scottish Dragoons, Scotch Guards. So it was military. Um, yeah, it's all geared that direction. So it may, yeah, it, it may, it may have, have been, been regimental at first. <clears throat> yeah. That's fair. It yeah. may have been regimental. That's okay. just the the brighter version. I don't know. It's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> guess and be wrong. Yeah. Um, no. But I could I could see it evolving out of that. And that's how it has so easily become a universal one is because once you're retired, if you still have the kilt, you want to wear the same kilt you wore in the service. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the kilt you wear. Same thing with Black Watch. There's um, something to that, too. I yeah. could absolutely say. Or, as the military says, okay, these kilts are now retired because they're old and used. If they were soldiers had to turn them back in, like selling them off as in, you know, rental kind of stuff, I could see that. You know, getting sold off and people buying them just being cost effective. Hmm. Like there's there's dozens of different avenues I could see it coming into pop popular. Yeah. It gets messy possession. pretty quick. Yeah, I'm curious now though. That's, me too. That's three things now. I'll go home and try and read up on. I want you to read up on them and then give me the clip notes. <laughs> okay, I can do that. <laughs> All right, Mr. Eric. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Getting paid to research Scottish culture. I got, I'm in the catbird seat, guys. Um, all right, Cam this is a silly one. Cameron is asking us, uh, where is Eric's Sheriff Muir, Rocky? The mascots need, their, need a reality. <laughs> or the mascot needs to be a reality. The... I didn't know I was a mascot. Sheriff, I, Eric, no, Sheriff Eric is a mascot? If you, if you, if caricature, I don't know. Caricature? Maybe he means caricature. Do you get know. to run out in the field at halftime? Yeah. Yeah, that. <laughs> Me and Gritty. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Eric, in the Sheriff Eric thing, inflatable arm-waving tube man out on 724. There you go. No? No. Okay. Um, when we do our, our summer sale. Yeah. Every kilt must go. His prices are insane. No. <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, no, we have not invested in the, uh, very, very, very expensive Sorry. purple velvet Sheriff Muir for Eric. Hasn't happened yet. No. I, it, at some point, if I have a major life event that I need the outfit for, maybe I'll buy one, but I haven't got a trigger powerful enough to pull that my wife will go along with it. So no. I don't see myself owning any Sheriff Muir for a while. If I do get one, it would be black, not purple, to be honest. As much as I think the purple would be a hoot, it'd definitely be black if I actually bought one. You gotta get like the the alligator shoes then too. You gotta get the you know yep. the hat with a feather. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm you not making another one of those worst you, outfits ever you need graphics. The, you need the 78 Cadillac with the uh, now that <laughs> tiger I'm, skin print on the that inside. That I'm down with. I've always wanted a pimp mobile. I freaking love pimp mobiles. They're awesome. With the fog lamps and everything, the fog headlights. Yeah. Sick. I love those cars. Like blue shag carpeting in the back. Yeah. 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 No. All right. So, sorry, Cameron. I, I, oh, you can oh, you can do a GoFundMe. <laughs> no, no, you're not going to GoFundMe. <laughs> Two reasons. One, it's a horrible thing to ask people for money for. Two, I don't want to have do to it. actually do this. <laughs> All right. Next question. Mac or me? Um. Well, that, that was, was that was kind of a throwaway. Yeah, so. it's a throwaway. Do another one. So I'll do another one. Okay. Um. Uh, this is about kilt care. Uh, Kristen, Kristen Strasner, Strasner, forgive me. Um, saying I'd like to know if you have special cedar lined closets or other ways to keep your kilt safe from moths, um, where you live or in different parts of the country. Um, how do you protect a kilt from moth attack? Um, I think everybody's probably got their own secret weapons for this, their own preferred tricks, yeah. but... Um, Mothballs will work, but they stink to high hell. Yeah. Um, Cedar-lined uh, chests or drawers in your dresser and that kind of thing, those could work. There's a question about how well cedar works to to dissuade moths. Really? Um, so it's not a lock? I thought they were, it was like, oh, cedar, you gotta have cedar. Yeah, it's, it's one of those, I don't know if it's an old wives' tale or if there's um, hmm. how much truth to it there is, or okay. at least I'd say this, with the cedar, I've heard recently someone complaining that they had the cedar bags or cedar blocks with all their kilts. Um, and they still and got attacked? They still got attacked by moths. Oh, yeah, so, but you have to reactivate those. Like, you have, like... You have to sand it. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on how much cedar and how strong of an odor it is, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those will work, um, you know, putting it in a zippered garment bag. If you don't have cedar or mothballs available and you live somewhere where there's a lot of moths out in the country somewhere, um, that could be a good idea. Um, you can always fold your kilts instead of hanging them. You can fold them and put them in a drawer um, or in a trunk, mm -hmm. like a, a cedar chest. Um, I don't know. Do you have any particular? We don't really have a moth problem, so I've I've gotten moths occasionally, but interestingly enough, when I've had moths in my closet, they've not gone after my kilts. They've gone after my sweaters. Lucky. I've lost yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's luck or if it's just that they prefer the more open weave, softer wools of my sweaters as opposed to the hard, more treated tartan wool. Chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. I've never okay. knock wood. I've never had a kilt attacked by moths, but I have had moths go after sweaters in the same closet. I do use sweeter, sweeter. I feel sweeter. I use cedar. Um, I have some various cedar products I've gotten over the years just to try this or try that. Um, I think the rougher it is, the better. Um, it definitely needs to be reactivated. And I'm honestly at this point, the next time I do it, I'm probably gonna go to the hardware store and buy uh, cedar siding shingles because they're they're really strong. They're surface area, exactly. Good surface area, Large yeah. surface area, very rough, um, and that increases the amount of Fumigation. Yeah. yeah. The, the esters. Um, so I think that's the trick is you can't just buy uh, something at like a Walmart, you know, a bunch of little cubes of cedar and think it's going to last for years. You definitely have to sand it or touch it up or replace it for it to work. Um, how effective it is compared to other techniques in the, you know, scientifically speaking, I don't know. I know it's a traditional technique and it's worked okay for me as far as I can tell. The only thing I would say as well is... <clears throat> um, Mac and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong in this. Um, the uh, part of what the, the moths are attracted to is the oils mm -hmm. as they eat. So I yeah. would say if you're going to have your kilt dry cleaned, don't dry clean it right before you wear it. Dry clean, like if you wear it and you sweat a lot and you have a lot of oils, like you went to two weddings in a month um, and you have, you know, you're dancing like a crazy nut um, and your, your kilt is in need of a dry cleaning. Don't wait until the next time you're going to be wearing your kilt to dry clean it. Hmm. Dry clean it and then put it away to kind of, you know, strip the, the your, your body oils out of the kilt um, before putting it away versus waiting till about till you're about ready That's to wear it. I would think it would be the lanolins in the wool itself that they're attracted to as opposed to human oils. But it's probably both. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that would, could explain why they go after a sweater 
like some of my old, you know, some of my Williams wool sweaters before they get or a scarf before they go after my kilt. But yeah, Mac, you had a thought? I say usually what I've seen um, as far as the recent attacks that I've had um, <laughs> at the at the at our old apartment, um, which I had to throw way too much stuff away. Oh jeez. Um, a lot of it was things where where they where they seemed to attack was where things had spilled or things had oh. other things had where not necessarily where I was in, in direct contact with but it was other outside things. So um, from my understanding, cedar alone is not a complete deterrent. It you okay. need a little it need a combination of several things. Okay, like I've gone all out and done cedar, lavender, plastic bins like. We've gone yeah. all in on that stuff. We, Lavender, we're yeah. full full war was uh, declared. So bug zapper in the closet, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and you you just basically a combination has worked for you. That's what it's. Perfect. I'm holding steady now, but okay. now we're moving. So okay, we'll see what the new place brings. Good luck. Yeah. I will say this: if you if you are concerned about something or you think it's been attacked by moths, um, one thing you can do. One thing that my wife does with roving or other wool projects, if the moths seem to be at it or in, there's a risk of them coming after it, put it in the freezer. Um, that's yep. a classic yep. technique. Just yep. freeze the freaking thing um, and that will kill any eggs. For 24 hours. Yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. You want to make sure it's good and good and frozen. Yep. yep. Yeah, crisp those eggs. But You can also burn it entirely and buy a new <laughs> That will destroy the eggs. <laughs> yeah. 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 It'll exactly. also, you know, uh, like cover up any, any evidence of the holes. True. It'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. It's good. <laughs> All right. Um, but I would say, yeah, rough and replace it regularly. And, yeah, like Max saying, try a combination. Yeah, I think I think it, I think I am thinking of lavender, that there's not a lot of evidence that it actually works. It smells wonderful. It's very, very pretty. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how well it works for uh, for deterring moths. Okay. I mean, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Whose question was that, Max or Eric's? That was mine. Okay. Mac. Next question. All right. So we have Colleen asking, uh, I have met many people who are al or have an allergy or highly sensitive to wool. Um, and I have a few friends who would love to see, come in the shop, but they're a little <coughs> leery with the wool. Uh, is there, what options are there out there for people who have allergies for wool? Sure. Now you touched on this uh, a while back. With your amazing suggestion I, of wearing tartan in your underwear. Yes. <laughs> um, I still think that's... <clears throat> people that say they're allergic to wool, um, there's there's degrees right. of al allergy. There's sensitivity, yes. and then there's true allergy. Yes. But um, So my my suggestion from another show was to buy a swatch of wool, whatever tartan, shove it in your underwear, pin it in there with a safety pin, and wear it out for the day. Um, put it on your butt. Um, and see see if you actually react to it and you're actually allergic or if there's just a mild sensitivity or whatever. Um, the, the ways to avoid a wool allergy, if you, if you can only buy a wool kilt, meaning your tartan is only available in wool, um, wear biker shorts, uh, make sure you're tucking your shirt in, just basically avoid direct contact with the skin. Um, bike shorts that maybe come down to, you know, three inches above the knee, so there's not that much contact with the skin down by the knee. In the odd instance, or in the instance where you actually are highly allergic, even with that, you're still breaking out underneath, you're in the last two inches above the knee, then look for a synthetic fabric kilt. We have wool yeah. kilts, and we have polyviscose kilts. The, the best alternative to wool, not equal, but the best alternative that we have found is polyester rayon or polyester viscose fabric. Um, it's made by one of the same mills in the UK that makes our wool cloth. Um, but yeah, that's the only alternative that we will put our stamp of approval on. Yeah, and I'd say, and if it's for women's clothing, you could look into silk options too. Yep. Yeah. Or and I would say this selection of tartans is very limited in silk, I think. But yes, and but the the other thing I'll point out is, ten or eleven ounce wool is much, much softer, much, much more forgiving okay. than a heavier weight wool. Okay. It's a little bit scratchier. Yeah, um, yeah. Not scratchy as in, like, it's going to, like, leave, you know, burn marks on your leg as you wear it throughout the day. Um, but it is 11-ounce fabric, 10-ounce fabric. It's much more suited for women's garments. It's lighter. It's it's 
floppier, it has a nicer, softer hand so to it. more of an open weave, isn't it? So just... Not, not really more open. It's not open, okay. It's just because the, the individual fibers are still smaller, it just kind of drapes nicer. Okay. Um, it's, it's a softer drape. Okay. Um, if, instead of, like, if you put it over a rod, instead of it, like, going, you know... You know, going out and kind of slowly curving down and like the, the tensile strength of the fabric for lack of a better term it would flop down quicker okay um it has less of a hand to it i see um so yeah that's why most women's kilted skirts are made out of 10 or 11 ounce cloth because in and the other thing is women will shave their legs so they don't want something that's going to be scratchy and it, 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 more sensitive. Their skin will be more sensitive, therefore, yeah. because of that. Yeah. So they're looking for a lighter weight, which is also nicer on against the skin. But if we're talking about universal straight up know, allergies for yeah. men or women, then polyviscous is the best solution we found. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Hopefully that helps. Mr. Eric. Who me? Yes. Okay. You. You in the kilt. It's so weird sitting here again. It's been so long. Um, <laughs> I missed you, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a little bit. This is a little bit um, off the beaten path. But uh, Joshua Wade is asking us uh, what hats are good for semi-formal or formal Highland wear. Are Highland bonnets or Scotch bonnets acceptable for formal occasions? It's all you, Chief. It's I all am me. Not, I am not the hat guy. It's all me. I'm a hat guy. Let's kick back. Um, Let us smoke. Relax. If you if you want to if you want to actually it's not live on YouTube. He has a separate clip, but there's a bit we did where I actually made Rocky wear some cowboy hats, and it's pretty funny. Um, hats are not usually considered to be a formal thing, um, at least not in the modern age. So, um, absolutely, if you want a hat which is going to look proper with Highland attire, um, you're going to want to go with a a true bonnet. Balmoral, Glengarry, you know, one of those standard types. Um, they're not really considered part of a formal kit for a civilian because they are something you wear outdoors. You do not wear a hat indoors if you are a gentleman. Um, therefore, you're not going to be wearing a hat in most instances where you're wearing a formal outfit, which usually is um, indoors and very often in the evening, you know, after six. Um, so if you wanted a formal look for say an outdoor wedding, I guess, um, and people are saying yes, we're going to have uh, a formal Prince Charlie type wedding, but we're doing it in the Rose Garden, um, and you wanted to have a hat, then I would definitely say you should go for either a Glengarry or uh, a Balmoral. I would not go for a uh, uh, a bonnet in the sense of a more of the traditional bag shape, untailored uh, Scottish bonnet. Um, because it just looks floppy. It looks messy. Um, usually when you're, anytime you're talking about formal dress, the more crisp it is, the more angular it is, the more formal it is. So a, uh, a Balmoral or a Glengarry, something like that, the two standard types again, which are famous because of bagpipe uniforms, um, will do best for a formal-ish looking hat. But are hats considered a piece of formal attire? Not really. Um, parade attire or representational attire I would say like you know certainly a, a, a Balmoral with tweed um, you're gonna see that all the time like if you, you can easily imagine a clan chief at a clan gathering you know you know you know trotting about the field with his Balmoral with his eagle feathers and everything and it looks very formal looks very official but it's not formal in the sense of tuxedo I wouldn't even call it like in in the true definition of Formal or semi-formal. Yeah, I wouldn't. It's, it's smart emblematic. Day wear. Yeah, it's 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 symbolic. It's it's uniform, but it's not formal. Yeah, it's it can look nice, but it's right. not semi-formal by the true definition. Right. Or formal by the true definition. It's just it's it's smart day wear. It's it's sharp dress. Right. It's it's the bee's knees, um, mm -hmm. but it's not formal. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's it. That'd be my advice if you if you are an occasion where for some reason you need to have a hat and look formal, but it's uh, strictly speaking, I cannot imagine somebody wearing a Glengarry with a Prince Charlie and no. a and a and a it would just look fly weird. blade. I'm 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 even going back to like the uh, uh, the <clears throat> the 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 catalog photos of when you know 
in the 20s and 30s when the Prince Charlie came out, yep. like the the, yep. the mail order catalog stuff. And I can't remember any of them having any kind of correct headwear. It's right. just they'll you, you can I can see images and photographs of people in with headwear in tweeds during the day. Tweeds, but, yes. But yes, but especially I'm thinking of one catalog in particular from the 30s where. The guy's there with the slick back, wet look, 1930s hair, and he's in the Prince Charlie, and he's got the cigarette, and he's looking very cool. But Did it have the, like the extender thing on it? No, nah, no, nah, just you know, just okay. he's got the cigarette. But the point is, it's he's in evening attire. The Prince yeah. Charlie, the Prince Charlie Cote is evening attire, so he's not wearing a hat. So, yeah, that's basically it. Black you... tie or white tie, I would not recommend wearing a hat. Nah, it's, you don't need to. Yeah, it's just not part of it. Even if you're bald and ugly like me, it's fine. Yeah, you look better without a hat. Yeah, it's you want to, you want to go you want to go to the next level instead of your hat. Invest some money in some white kid gloves. Do that with your formal outfit. That will knock it out of the park. Fancy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> your your date will love it at least. She'll now, be all about it. My next the next show. I'm just gonna like I'm gonna dress like this with a pair of white gloves. Do you own a pair? I can get a pair. It's it's either that or I go one glove, rhinestone, Michael Jackson. <laughs> the Jackson Tartan. Exactly. I actually own two pairs of white kid gloves. I think I bought a pair for Adam when he was taking photos, so when he touched the metal stuff, it didn't That's not kid, though. That's <sighs> cotton. Ah, uh, shucks. You know, kid, no, kid, kid, like soft leather. Yeah. Like, like. Yeah, go leather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Interesting. That's so you I'll do not. That's so you do not get oils on your, uh, your date's dress. That's the whole point of those gloves was to keep you from getting schmutz on the very expensive gown, of the lady you were escorting. Good to know. Yep. I don't have that problem. Don't get them any fancy things. Yeah, and you're not a ballroom dancer either. Next question. I cut a rug though. Yeah. Oh yeah, that I know. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. But. <laughs> I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> we went to a, uh, here's a random story. We went to, as a, as a company, remember we went to the real McKenzie's? Oh my God, that was awesome. <clears throat> Silversville Theater. That was, that was a hoot. And uh, <laughs> uh, I was out there dancing and they were, they were in the back <laughs> videotaping me. Like, ha ha, we videotaped you. Like, we're going to use this for blackmail. I'm like, in order to blackmail me, I have to care. I don't care. That said, if I can never find that footage, I'm putting it in this episode. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to find it as a long time. Yes, exactly. Okay. The old Axl Rose, the hip movement with the kilt on. Go. Oh, yeah. good stuff. There you go. Mr. Mac. I think uh, good old Chris Gullick would be jealous of that swish. Stop ogling me, Chris Gullick. <laughs> Questions. All right. So we have, I think this is a new question. We have Ken asking, is there a place where he can find specialty kilt hose made for a prosthetic leg? We're talking like a modern prosthetic where it's very, it's all like cyber, cyberific with the, the hydraulics and stuff. Possibly it does. He yeah. doesn't specify it was that. Like, it was like, you know, the old timey wooden leg. I'd assume it would have a semblance of a human leg shape. So you just use a regular. <coughs> That's an interesting question. Um, if it were me, um, this is me. This isn't, you know, obviously anybody else except for you. Um, I would, I would wear it like a badge of honor. If I, if I lost a limb, I'd be rocking that. Shit. I mean, I would literally, I, I wouldn't care. It would just be, that's who it is. That's what it is. Boom, done. Um, if I still had the other leg, I'd probably wear one kilt hoe, hoe? Well, one, yeah. one sock, and the ghillie brogue or, what, or my footwear on the other foot, and just, you know, whatever you wear with a prosthetic leg, and just be done with it. If it's the, like the, the angular scoopy thing that helps you run faster, that thing. I don't um, know why I'd be wearing kilt hose with, with athletic replacement ones anyway yeah but. but if like if it's a if it's a if it's a if it's if it looks like a leg kind of thing uh prosthetic mm -hmm. then then i would just you know get a pair of kiltos put one on put the garter on and try to make it look as as regular as much like the other leg as possible yeah but i wouldn't really, um i wouldn't really care myself yeah, I mean, obviously he's asking because it's something he'd like to try and do. Yeah, you know, that's that's his, your chosen aesthetic, you know, or something you want to experiment with for for fun. Um, absolutely, I mean, there's nothing wrong with just showing off the the prosthetic. But 
Oh, so exactly. He didn't. He just responded. Uh, titanium at the at the okay. bottom. Uh, put plastic uh, concaved. Concave. Okay. So here's what your my first thought is, and I can't see what your specific limb looks like, but most of the ones I've seen, um, the way that the the, uh, the springs and hydraulics or whatever, um, there's usually it's very skinny and mechanical around the ankle area. I would be tempted to say, yeah, just get some regular your chosen pair of kilt hose probably maybe possibly a size smaller so it's a little tighter and i would experiment with taking chunks of pool noodle or pipe insulation to try to pad out the skinnier parts of the prosthetic and then pull the hoe on over that um and then use something either like use like zip ties or some other kind of mechanical attachment to keep it from falling down or you know if it's there's any number of ways you can make it stick to the leg. It's just a question of how much of a mess it's going to be for you to deal with when you want to take it off again. Um, I think you could play around with the, uh, you know, the foams and stuff that people use for cosplay construction, which are easy enough to find in craft stores or, or pool noodle foam or something, just to fill out the skinny mechanical parts of the legs. Do you get more of a that inverted cone shape that a natural leg has? Yeah, um, the. But there's no special hoe, special brand or type no, of kilt hose no. I'd recommend for doing this. I would, I would get a cheap pair and experiment uh, and play around with it. Maybe get uh, get a cheap pair in a couple of different sizes and see if maybe a smaller or larger size kilt hoe works better for wrapping effectively around the mechanics. I wouldn't, for, for me, I wouldn't do, it's what it's going to look like if, if I tried that, knowing my level of comfort with craft projects. Um, if I tried that, I would wreck it. I would screw it up. Not the, the it's not my leg prosthetic. I'd screw up the project and it would end up looking like a dog's dinner. And I would just be like, you know what? Screw it. Just take it off. Just going to wear the prosthetic by itself. So in, in my mind, it's, if it's not bang on and the legs don't look the same, meaning calf thickness, the same kind of taper and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. then I would say... I'd err. I'd go the complete opposite direction and just own it. A lot of a lot of Highland wear, in general, the way you look, the way you put your outfit together, the the little tiny things that you like, the the belt buckle which shows your style, the sporn which shows your style. It's all about just owning the look, period, and being confident in the who you are and what you're wearing, period. So, if if you take this as an extension of that, I would just be who I am and wear the leg that I have, period. If I wanted it to look that way, not necessarily because I'm like, you know, embarrassed or anything like that by it, but I just wanted it just to see if I could do it, mm -hmm. then I'd say if you have a leg-shaped prosthetic that looks similar in diameter and taper and everything to your other leg, then you could get away with it. Just put on your regular kilos, tr strap on the, the, uh, the garters real tight at the top, you know, above yeah. the taper and call it done. Um, or <laughs> staple gun it to the leg, I don't know. Um, but the, uh, uh, outside of that, I wouldn't, I would be afraid that I would try, spend a lot of energy, spend a lot of time, potentially some money to get it right and still not be happy just with not the Not be outcome. happy with the results. Yeah. I'm taking the attitude that, um, that you're just wanting to do it for fun, that maybe he's been owning it for years and it's just, he wants to do it because he's bored. You know, it's like, I mean... That's fine. He wants to fin he wants to play around with seeing how close he can get to finishing off the look. Right. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are guys out there who would go the opposite direction and would do their walkathon and have a freaking saltire flag tied to the back of the, the leg so it's flapping around every time they walk. Yeah. Um, but that's the other question is, I don't know if he needs it for a wedding or something or if he needs it as a 10-foot rule, like he's marching in a parade and he just wants, pe wants it to look not distracting with his other bandmates like if he's in a band and he just needs it to look okay for the people on the yeah, sidewalk. Yeah, visuals close enough. Got yeah. that. That's, that um, makes sense. So I think there's a number of ways to experiment with it, but don't have a solid answer other than yeah. if it, you're going to experiment, invest in cheap hose in a couple different sizes and play around with fillers to round out the shape of the leg, I guess. Ken, uh, Ken, Ken is responding uh, here as well. Um, he's he, going back a couple steps he said about okay. the, the foam. He said that could work uh, but his clan crest is on it, uh, so he will just go. He's got kind of he, what, what? Wait, wait! He's got his clan crest on his leg. That's what it sounds that's like here. Sick man! Um, Why would you want to cover that up? That's so awesome. he's he's taking Rocky's advice and just gonna go uh, yeah. one legged. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, if I'd heard that in the first place, I wouldn't have gone off on it. On it. Yeah. Clank crust on your limb? That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, so... Don't wear the bedazzled limb that day. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that clashes with the outfit, but the, the biomechanical stuff looks badass. I would just... I, would I want, the, I, want the, I want the built-in skin do sheath in the leg, so it's like cyber skin do. You can just pop right out of your leg. I could see that. Yeah. Dude, go like full on RoboCop. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you're okay. telling me to do no, no. The problem is I want to do a horrible Scottish brogue as a joke, and it would be really crass of me to do so. Okay, fair. Dead or alive, they're coming with me. Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> it's no good. It's no yeah, good practice that. Yeah, dude. So <laughs> could be could be fun if you ever do want to try it, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, we've used this device. Uh, slight tangent. We've used this device elsewhere as well. Take pictures of it. Like have your, you know, either in front of a mirror or if you know somebody else who has you know, a camera, take a picture of you of you dressed up with it one way, with it with the sock on, with it you know another way. But my only my only caveat would be if the legs aren't the, the prosthetic isn't the same size as your other leg and the sock looks smaller or or you know because it's it's meant to like you know hug the leg if it doesn't hug the legs and the legs look the same size it's just gonna look off yeah yeah cool it's fascinating it's fascinating awesome dude. idea yeah good luck let us know yeah. how it works yeah mr eric Shall we'll I? do one okay. more from you and one more from mac depending on the time we got we've been long-winded and i apologize folks it's been no. a long time since i've been here since i've been so i've just been like blah 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 oh, um Okay, here's a, a, a fashion-y one. Cameron White is saying, um, I've seen some displays of waistcoats for a Prince Charlie jacket, uh, where in most cases they have three buttons, but I've also seen some that have five buttons. Is the five-button mm -hmm. waistcoat acceptable <clears throat> with a Prince Charlie? The uh, uh, classically, traditionally, uh, Prince Charlie has a three-button waist waistcoat, um, and you wear it with a bow tie. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a ruche tie or whatever. Yeah, ruche yeah. tie. Yeah. Um, you call it. It's basically a big, looks like a clown tie. It's a big knot here that's kind of like squished up and kind of frilly looking or, you know, wrinkly looking. It's and then ruched, a big, if you will. Ruching means wrinkled. To gather. Yeah. Gathered. Um, and then it comes like to a big, big old honking tie thing down the bottom. It does not look good with... A, a three button waistcoat because the button or the you know the buttons come down here the V you know comes all the way down to eh, let's say four inches above the belly button or so um, so it's you get you're left with this big clown looking tie um, it looks okay it looks you know some people love the look it looks good with a uh, a five button waistcoat where you just see the very top and the ruching but it doesn't look good when you have a low cut you know uh, low cut vest right therefore. A lot of the rental companies in Scotland, as as is the way, um, as the people in Scotland start making requests and they say, hey, I love that ruched tie look. I'd like to rent one of those. Rental companies start offering those, but they don't really look good with a low cut V on the front of a three button PC vest. So the rental company started saying, okay, well, well then we'll, we'll rent the, the Argyle five button vest with a Prince Charlie jacket. Right. Therefore, you have a higher, you know, V, and it looks much, much nicer. Um, so that's kind of bec become a little bit of a trend in the last three years or so. Um, are people getting five-button waistcoats with a Prince Charlie jacket? Um, it's not traditional, but it's kind of the evolution of how things are going a little bit. Yeah, I just, when I see that, I basically think rental outfit. I think it's entirely, it makes me think, oh, they're saving money by only offering one type of vest. You know? I, no, it's, I, I just, it just looks, the, the problem I have with it is that is where is the bottom, where the bottom of the waistcoat and the bottom of the jacket are not going to line up the way they're designed to. They, they yeah. do, because they... Do they really? Yes, because I don't know. they'll I've rent... seen some pretty bad examples. But... Now, okay. It's, You're I'll... saying they'll change the sizes up. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah. It's, okay. they'll, for the vest... Um, like if I'm ordering, if somebody says I want to buy a Prince Charlie, but I want a five button vest, if they are a 48 regular, I'm going to say, Hey, I want a PC 48 regular and five button vest will actually receive 
a 48 short vest. I see. With a 48 regular yeah, yeah. jacket. Okay. So the bottom of the vest is an inch and a half, I believe, shorter yeah. on the vest. So it comes and it meets more with the bottom of the jacket or the coatee than it does in the than it does with the uh, and, the five. And, and of course, three. you're wearing a kilt belt with it. So of course, that gives you more room for the kilt belt to pop out nicely, right? Or the bottom of your shirt to show. No. See, there, there's problem. There's problems with doing that hack. I think you don't. Well, you but don't. Most guys renting a kilt don't care the same way. In fairness, we you might. shouldn't be renting, or buying, or wearing a shouldn't um, a vest with a kilt belt and buckle. But they do. That's my point. Is a it's, lot of time I see this look, and you could, there's a belt included. I don't. It depends on the. It depends on the. A couple things. It depends on the rental company. Yeah. And it depends on the person doing the renting. If sure. I am. In business, whether it's a tuck shop, whether it's a rent, a kilt rental shop, whatever it is, if I'm in business to make the customer happy, sure. and I have the attitude of the customer's always right, yeah. and the guy comes in and says, well, I want to rent a five button, a PC, kilt, dress born, and a belt and buckle, if I'm the rental shop, I may, you know, like we would in here, here in the shop, we'd say, well, just so you know, typically you don't wear a belt with the dress born or with a uh, jacket and vest. Yeah. And but if the customer says, "Well, I don't care. I still want to wear it," then sure. Who am I to you know stop you from doing I, it? I may have been being a little bit facetious. cynical and yeah. facetious there. I apologize. But at the same time, it's yeah, you're gonna see differing levels of tradition, differing levels of knowledge, differing you know levels of fashion. It's it's up to the person wearing it. And the guidance right. they're receiving or the knowledge that they have, and a lot of times from a lot of companies, especially if it's a rental industry and it's just get them and get them out, cycle it through, Yeah, there's a lot less care involved um, in making sure that every single tiny detail is correct. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, yes. So I wouldn't, um, I guess the bottom line is, I wouldn't, I would not personally recommend doing it. Um... It, it, from from my perspective, it just looks a little bit odd. Um, it's not the end of the world either. It's not that <clears> bad. <throat> um, if I if I were gonna pick and choose things like that, and somebody told me I had to do it, I would do a Brian Baru jacket because I think the shawl collar would accentuate the higher vest better than the peaked lapels of a PC. I think that would be a smoother grouping. I would, lack of a better way to put it. You think it'd be worse? I think it'd be worse because you, you're going to have a five button vest with no lapels and it's very angular. And then you have the nice sweeping the on mm -hmm. a on Maybe. a three button Brian Baru vest. It is the same as a Prince Charlie vest, but it still has the shawl collar or okay. shawl lapels on the not shawl collar, but it has lapels that don't have angles on them. It's okay. a nice sweeping bottom, so that pairs nicely. Um, I I myself am less fussed by it. Um, it's a fashion thing. Fashion evolves. Um, over time, meaning 20 years from now, we'll see if it sticks. Um, is it going to yep. be a, a five-button vest and a rouge tie with a PC coat? Is that going to be the, the blue, powder blue tuxedo of the 70s? Are people going to look at their wedding photos and go, oh, man, I should have just gone with the traditional three-button? Or are they going to go, no, nope, still like it, and that's what fashion becomes I think it's, I don't know if it would become it, but it, I could see it being accepted because it's more subtle than other things. I mean, there's there's a lot, if you look at the more fashion forward for higher outfits from Scotland right now, they're doing things like solid color purple, and I'm not exaggerating, I've actually seen this picture, like a solid color lavenderish purple kilt and waistcoat and then a tan tweed jacket on top. That, yeah, it, it's, and that's just kind of like, huh? Um, that's like so trendy. I don't think it'll last. But what you're describing, I hope so. I could see it'd be. I'll send you the picture. <laughs> oh, so yeah, not after I eat. It's a different um, twist on a tweed suit, basically. But it's yeah. But it's well, the tweeds. kilt and kilt and vest the same, and then the jacket a completely different color. Tweeds and smart day wear and and kind of toning down formal wear is a huge trend right now, um, because it it's classic and it's just classy. It looks awesome. Well, they're toning um, it down, but they're also making getting it funky. There's some there's some funky. Yeah, it's and or it twisting it, it, making it their own, like the the chocolate bronze cantle on it or whatever. Right. Um, so there's there's different ways to twist it. Ultimately, fashion evolves, and that's where we're going to end on this. Is the fashion for it is going to evolve? It's going to 
you know, it ebb and flow. It may go a little bit out one direction and then come back. It may, you know, like a river, just take a hard right turn. Um, so it's, you don't know, only time will tell. It is not traditional, but it is fashion-y, and it is what is currently being done right now in addition to a three-button vest. Right. It's not replaced the three-button vest. It is giving grooms and rental customers another option over in Scotland. Yep. Cool. That was yours, Mr. Mac? Yes. All righty. So we have Logan. Um, he's actually been doing a lot of research while uh, – on uh, on the feed today, um, for, uh, I also want to say that I think the questions this today have been really good. Funky kind of questions, a, I've really yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been a, a, yeah. a nice variety of good stuff. Good first show back. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know enough pi- about pirates. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Logan is is. Arr, get disappoint me, Eric. <laughs> That's he, based on Irish accent. Pirate talk is based on Irish accent. I can see that. I yes. It. Yeah. It's true. Anyway, go ahead. So uh, Logan is doing some research on on his tartan. He's he's looking at getting. Um, and he cool. came across the uh, Wilsons of Bannockburn uh, color. Nice. He wants to know who are the Wilsons of <coughs> Bannockburn. Who are they? They had a couple fiend. of hits back in the seventies, but <laughs> yeah. Um, Wilsons of Bannockburn was a was. I don't know if it, I think it was the biggest mill. I'll go out on a limb and say the biggest mill um, back in the eighteen hundreds, um, mid eighteen hundreds at least. Um, they, I think they go back as far as the. Late well, they probably go. Century. Yeah, they probably go yeah. back. They go back further than that. But by the time of the mid 1800s, they were the biggest meal. Mm-hmm. Um, the they had their own specific. Um, every mill has their own color palette. Um, Wilson's Bannockburn uh, and the the modern ancient weathered muted color palettes kind of have evolved, and that is currently the options that each customer has. But Wilson's Bannockburn was a huge mill. And they had effectively, I don't want to say one shade of green and one shade of blue or whatever, but they had a standard color palette like most mills did. So uh, you'll actually see on occasion a mill do kind of a throwback and they'll do a Wilson's Bannockburn colorway um, where it'll be, and, and the basic difference between a Wilson's Bannockburn color and a traditional modern color is this. Moderns modern color palette for tartans. You have red is like a scarlet red red. Blue is a navy blue. Green is a like a beer bottle dark green. Um, yellow is a bold yellow. That kind of thing. For Wilson's Bannockburn, they used navy blue. They used scarlet red. They used the bold yellow. But for the green color, they used a uh, what I would term like a muted green, like an olive kind of color green. So it's kind of in today's speak, it's a mixture of muted and modern, like let's say 60-70% modern, 30% muted, um, but it gives a, a a different coloring to the tartan. That was that was just their colors. That's just what they did. It's the mill's preference on this is the green that we are going to use, this is the blue we are going to use, this is the red we are going to use, and having a single shade of red, single shade of blue, single shade of green will be cost effective so you can weave a whole different bunch of you know different tartans from the same colorways um it just you know economies of scale you can order more green yarn in the same color right um what was his actual question now that i've kind of rambled you want to know where it came from who who, who who are they yeah um basically it's just a really big mill from the you know early to mid 1800s um and potentially before they are now defunct they no longer exist um, they're, uh, uh, an, an artifact. They had a lot of tartans and a lot of the, the tartans that exist today are from their pattern books. They kind of carried forth before the tartan register, before the Scottish tartans authority, before the Scottish tartan society, before um, the Sobieskis, <laughs> their samples predate, predate the Sobieskis. Some, I think it was around the same time. Mm, I think they were earlier. Um, We'll check that, um, but the it's we'll around the same time. Not it's it overlaps. At very, oh, it very definitely least. overlaps. Yes, um, but there's a lot of things that are like that was. There, there wasn't a cataloging of the tartans. The mills right. were the catalog. 
um, or the Sobieski Stewarts, who some people will just call straight up con men. Other people will call con men, but with you know innovators. With purpose. Yeah, innovators. Thank you. Mm. Um, the uh, uh, that's kind of how tartans got enshrined and in you know and carried forth and didn't change their patterns. It, they became standardized because of Wilson's Bannockburn specifically, and because of the Sobieski Stewarts, where they kind of put it on wax, so to speak. And said, "This is the McDonald Tartan. Period. Here you go." Um, and then the you know clan chief McDonald might say, "Okay, yep, looks great. That's the official clan McDonald Tartan, or whatever." Um, and it kind of just became enshrined that way. But they're they are a very very important piece of the puzzle going back in in Tartan history. Yeah, I think, and that's one of the main reasons you might want to consider it. Basically, in my opinion, is that basically it feels like you're in touch with that portion of the history when you choose that palette you have that you have a little bit more of a a, a a legend in the back of your mind because of what you've chosen because it's like wow this is a connection to 200 plus years ago um i personally like the palette a lot I, I tend to describe it a little bit as being kind of like jewel tone so if you think you're drawn to um muted tartans um or or you know that kind of deep, rich kind of color. Um, I would say it's a it's a really beautiful option. I really I really like your the Stuart. Uh, your Stuart. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that kilt. But um, Strathmore is a, a one of the mills over in Scotland. Or, um, they do three or four. No, they do Grant and Stuart Old, and I think they do one or two others um, in Wilson's of Bannockburn colors. Um, so we we have made them before. There's a couple. That are stock options, um, but not too many. A lot of time you're going to have to end up with a custom weave. But it is, it's neat because it's different than everything else that's out there. And to Eric's point, it kind of, it's it's a talking point. It's something that kind of gives you a connection to the past um, in a way that just yeah. buying a, a stock tartan can't do. Yeah. So, unless yeah. it's one of those from Strathmore. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a neat way to honor the past. Um, but live in the present. Yeah, it's not any more legitimate or illegitimate than any tartan from any mill. It's just, yeah. but, it, but it's got a cool factor. Yeah, and it's beautiful. So, absolutely. Yeah, very good. All right, we'll do we'll do one more short one, and then your question of the day. Yeah, question of the day. I got to figure out a question of the day. Okay. What kind of pirate would you be? <laughs> um, I. This is hmm. Which way do I want to go with this? I will give you the choice. I can either this there's we there's one question here which is specific to us and is more techy in a way, and there's another one which we will have we will offer a lot of opinion on, and we'll definitely go over time more than we are if I ask you it. So heads, heads. Okay, Brian Taylor is asking, what's the big deal about Scottish shortbread? What's the deal with Scottish shortbread? What's the deal with Scottish shortbread? Um, it is a, a very, very simple recipe. Not necessarily easy to get good, easy to get right, easy to perfect, but it's a very, very simple cookie. It's what, flour, sugar? Flour, and... sugar, and butter. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to understand what the nature of the question is. Like... I, I maybe maybe he's trying to ask if people like do people make it a mountain out of a molehill like it's really nothing that special but for some reason people are like oh Scottish shortbread um maybe yeah um I mean, it's certainly emblematic of Scotland yes you know um the uh there's you can do some interesting twists on it mm -hmm. um you can have like lavender infused or you know uh, orange infused and that kind Caraway. of thing yeah mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so there's different angles you can take for it but. In, at its core, it's just a very, very simple, good, crackery cookie that'll go well with coffee and tea. Yeah. Or you could say, like, what's the big deal about potatoes for Irish cuisine? Just as easily. You know? I or, mean, it's yeah. yeah, it's a national food. Um, I think... Uh, I think it because it's sweet and tasty, and it's, got, it's kind of a comfort food kind of a... Feel vibe to it, to it. Yeah, 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 because it's 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 something you would, could easily eat with tea or coffee or something, and just like ah, it says, I'm going to relax and enjoy this, and it's rich, heavy. So I think that's probably why people have a, a soft spot for it. 
um, besides the the national cultural draw. Um, it's not super distinctive compared to other foods of Scotland, like haggis, obviously. Um, other countries have shortbread kind of things, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, but it's pretty, but, like, it's still pretty, pretty emblematic. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's not, it's not, you know, Scotland, it doesn't scream Scotland like haggis. Or whiskey. Or, or scotch, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's still a, a, a good symbol of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course the, you know, the, the shortbread companies will wrap themselves in tartan to just kind of. Yeah. There is the, the Scottish factor. And, the that, and that yeah. could be, that could be where people could perhaps get cynical about it. It's like, oh, it wasn't really a thing. It's just these companies trying to sell it have made it a thing. You know, I could see that yeah. maybe, but, um, they're within the rights to do so. If yeah. I, you know, if I were trying to, if I were a baker, I'd, I'd, you know, key in on my national pride to, to sell baked goods, I suppose. But uh, I think it's homey. It's the hominess of it. It's 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 a it's a national thing. It's a cultural symbol, but it's also a homey one. It just makes you feel good, you know. Yeah. So I guess that's that's my take on it. Yeah. So it's question of the day. It's comfort food. Question of the day: What is your favorite dessert? Scottish, Irish, okay. Welsh. What's your favorite? Um, Welsh cookies. Scottish shortbread. Mm. Um, little little after dinner nip of the Scotch. Um, hmm. we're going to do, uh, circus peanuts, a very, very traditional Irish dessert. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, God. <laughs> oh. Circus um, peanuts and whiskey. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to barf. I don't know. I dig on circus peanuts, dude. Oh. A little stale. Oh, oh good. Yeah. They have to be stale. Oh, I had them stale. With um, whiskey? I added that myself, I guess. Yeah. But. Yeah, you did, but. That's fine. But still, um, it's, that's... I don't know. Bloody awful. What's what's your favorite cultural dessert? And we don't answer. This is just for the... Correct. Just for the folks at home. Just for the okay. folks at home. Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> I, I want to see a pull, like a wave of like circus peanuts memes. <laughs> oh uh, chasing God. Eric down the road. And <laughs> Crit, no. Crit, Chris Gulick is probably already posting a gif of a circus peanut. You know he is. Well, he, he just posted cheesecake with scotch, so... I could see that. Cheesecake? Yeah. Depending on, it depends on the scotch. But you can say that about half the things in yeah, the world. Is, it depends on which... Heavy. I don't know. It depends on which whiskey. Now, do you use your, your shortbread cookies as the crust for the cheesecake? Ooh. Scottish shortbread crust? It's an interesting idea. Little little rhubarb jam on top? Or a, or a banaki? Haggis-flavored cheesecake. <laughs> with, with, with shortbread cookie crust? Well, see, when you said, when you said... Flavored with iron brew. <laughs> just, just all in on the Scotland here, topped with a garnish of thistle. Yes, <laughs> you know we we talked about we did a, a, a social media video about munchie boxes recently, and the one munchie box we didn't cover, which I'm I'm sure they exist, but maybe they don't, is a dessert munchie box. Can you imagine a munchie box which is just like all like. Deep fried Bana Mars Bana bars, donuts, deep fried yeah, yeah and, and and shortcake and iron it's too brew much. and. I don't know. Sign yeah. me up. Diabe diabetes on, in a box. Yeah. Oh, Who's that knocking at the door? That's Wilfred Brimley. Yeah. <laughs> Come on in, Wilfred. <laughs> and and is that I, the Grim Reaper behind you? I really do. I really do think there's a market in this country for munchie boxes, and we should jump on it. Yeah, nobody as fat as we them. are, absolutely, yeah. there's a freaking yeah. market for it. Yeah. Why don't they sell munchie boxes in America? I don't get well, it. Well, effectively, they do. It's like, you know, it's like, called Costco. They? No, it's yeah. called <laughs> it's called Domino's Pizza with cheesy bread crust and you know. Hot it's dog not... infused, whatever. Like that's lazy. <laughs> I want, I want the variety. I want the, all the things in the box, man. Oh uh, yes. I wonder if they make like hot dog infused cheesy bread crust pizza with donut topping. Hmm. Oh, this is this. We're, we are <laughs> off the freaking rails. Yeah, right I now. think we're very tired, and yeah. it's been a long week. Yes. But Sorry. This everyone. was fun. Indeed. Good to have you back, Eric. Likewise. It's as an much honor as to be I here. do enjoy Mac, it's it's good to have the band back together, mm -hmm. guys. We're on a mission from Gad. We're gonna do can do like a group hug, there. a COVID hug, <laughs> a virtual oh, hug. God. Yeah. And, and we're hugging the cameras. And too. I I All will right. say your arms didn't were at perfect level on that. Really? Nice. Yes. Cool. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank you, boys and girls. Sorry for being as long winded as obnoxious as we are, but that's why you love us. So, we hope. <laughs> or at least we pretend you do. Right. In here, you love us. Whether you do or not, doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Until next time, boys and girls. Slanjava. Slanjava.
Santori. Tori san. Santori. Santori time. Santori time.